Audiobook Title Mix Audiobook Collection The 11th of July 2023 A Tale of Steel and Gunpowder 43 to 45 by Pixie Tokaizaki 14 Chapter 43 On the Road to Eris Nira and Ellie wiped the tears from their eyes while moving towards their destination which was the city gates where a merchant was waiting for them along the way the two met with Amiria who has a bag that carries her own things. She still wore the white hood with golden accents to hide her identity when traveling. Are you two ready? Amiria said while she walked up to them. Yep. I've got all my things ready. Ellie replied while motioning for her bag. Ready, replied Nira, and Amiria noticed the sleeping three-tailed vulpin sleeping on top of her bag. Then let's get going. Morning isn't going to last forever. She started walking towards the western gate, crossing the river that split the city into two halves. They then saw the wagon they're supposed to protect beside a horse stable that is very close to the city wall. Standing beside it was an old man. He had white hair and wore a white top, along with small, rounded glasses. The group can tell he is experienced in being a merchant because of his age. The man noticed their approach and turned towards the group with a friendly smile. Good morning. I suppose you are the adventures that are going to escort me to Eris? He said with an old, raspy voice. Yep. My name is Ellie, the person beside me is my twin sister Nira, and the hooded girl is the archer Amelia. Ellie introduced as Nira remembered what Amelia told them earlier while walking towards this location. Remember to refer to me as Amelia, to keep my little identity a secret. So we would have the element of surprise if we ever encounter one of those cultists again so Nira would have to always call her Amelia when mentioning her. Oh and this is Mafia Nira said as she kneeled down a bit so the merchant could see the small vulpin sleeping on her bag. Ah, I suppose I should reveal my name as well. You can call me Elias, the old merchant. He walked up to his wagon, which contained an assortment of items such as weapons, tools, and handmade objects such as jars, pots, and vases. One of you can ride inside here and one can be beside me while I steer the carriage, but one has to rent a horse to keep up with us. Our goal is to reach Eris in three days, he explained as the group nodded and huddled to discuss the positions. You two can climb inside, I already rented a horse yesterday, Amiria said while she pointed at the horse she rented. All right, it's decided, Ellie said while shrugging. We better get going, daylight is burning. Nira said as she climbed into the wagon beside the old merchant, I'm with you, sis. Ellie also climbed on the board on the back as Amiria mounted the horse she rented. Are we ready? Elias looked back to see Ellie with a thumbs up and Amelia, who was riding on the horse. Let's go. Elias then pulled the lasso to tell the two horses in front of them to start moving. The two horses clopped towards the exit as they felt the wagon shake with their movements. Amelia moved in front of them on her own horse to serve as the first line of defense if they ever got attacked. The group left the city gates in no time and is on the road toward Eris. Nira notified a lot of other merchants that were in line to go inside the town as she looked back to see the line of merchants along with the wall get smaller and smaller with distance. Nira thought of all the memories she enjoyed there as the town she grew up in slowly went farther and further away. By that time, it was already nearing midday. This is your first time traveling? Nira heard Elias say as she turned towards him. Yeah, I'm leaving the place where I grew up and my parents, who took care of me and Ellie, Nira replied as she gazed upon the open road that stretched for miles. Currently, the only things she could see were open fields that were occasionally lined with trees and the mountains when she looked to her left. I know that feeling. Heading to the great unknown with only you and your wagon as company. Elias had nostalgic expression on his face as he looked in front of them. At least I have Ellie and Mofu to keep me company, Nira said. Yeah, traveling with family is nothing compared to traveling by yourself, Elias explained as the girl beside him nodded in agreement. It was now midday, and the sun was at its peak as they stopped to have a small break. While resting at the side of the road, Elias questioned the big elephant in the room about Nira. Say, what's that strange tube you carry around with you? He pointed at said tube when he turned to Nira. Oh, it's my weapon. Nira explained briefly. How does it work? He questioned. I don't want to explain the details, but I can only say it works. 
Nero explained, which left the merchant with more questions than answers. He didn't pursue further thought because it would have been rude to do so. After a few minutes, they set out again to continue on their journey to the city of Aris. They traveled through large plains and forests before stopping when the sun started to set. They set up a campsite and started a small fire. After dinner, Amelia volunteered to be the first watch of the night. Nira, Ellie, and Elias went into their tents to rest for another long day ahead tomorrow. Mofu went to sleep on top of Nira with his small body curled up on the girl. 16. Chapter 44, Encounter When the next day came, Nira was now inside the wagon, while her sister was with the old merchant at the front. Amelia was still in front of them, still on the lookout for any possible dangers that may arise on the route. Nira then pulled out her lever action rifle and inspected the firing chamber for any residues from the gunpowder she was using. She did, in fact, find some that were clumped up near the gap between the barrel and the frame. So, with a piece of cloth, she cleaned the firing chamber so that it wouldn't cause her weapon any sort of issue, such as the ejector failing to eject the spent cartridges. After she was done cleaning, she loaded the magazine with ammunition again as she found herself deep in thought once again. A city bigger than Redfield and is a major trading hub would be a perfect place for some of these cult members to be hiding in the shadows. This lever action rifle is good, but ideally I need something simple, like a shotgun, which would be beneficial in the close quarters fighting. I should get to start working on it after we arrive she thought. Nera then felt her bag shake as Mofu jumped down from his little napping position inside the bag. Hey Mofu, Nera greeted, Mofu. Mofu's secondary colors then turned green as he pointed his nose to Nera's sling bag that contained her rations. Oh yeah, you were sleeping when we were eating breakfast, so you missed it. I'm sorry, here. Nera then pulled out two slices of garlic bread and handed them out to the small fox. Mofu immediately bit into it and started savoring his favorite food. Nera giggled at the small fox's antics and stared out from the back of the wagon. Her little view was suddenly interrupted when she felt the wagon suddenly stop moving. Ellie? What's wrong? Nera motioned for Mofu to stay inside the wagon so that he'd be the last line of defense for the merchant's belongings. Sis, we've got trouble. Looks like a couple of bandits showed up. Nera heard Ellie say from inside the wagon. Nero jumped down and walked towards the front of the wagon to find five men blocking the way. They wore rather cheap-looking blackened clothes, two of which were armed with bows, and three were armed with swords. Nero took her position behind Ellie, the latter already having her sword drawn, and Amelia, who was still on her horse with her bow pulled back and loaded with an arrow. Nero then aimed her rifle at the man in the center. Okay, this is what's going to happen. You three will surrender and drop your weapons while that old man will get off the wagon and place everything he is on him on the ground. Or else we'll have ourselves a little problem. Nira heard the first man say. He was in the middle, surrounded by the two other swordsmen. If you think that we'll allow that to happen, then you're delusional. Amelia said as she pulled the arrow she has on her bow further back. Suit yourself? Don't say we didn't try to resolve this peacefully. You're outnumbered anyway. Three against four he was cut off by two loud bangs that seemed to come from the girl who was holding the strange tube thing. When he looked back to see the state of his men, his eyes opened wide with terror as he saw two of his archers now lying dead with a hole in each of their heads. There. Now we're even. Three against three, Nira said as she pulled down the lever of her rifle to eject the spent cartridge. Of course. She had a hand waiting for it to catch the case so it could be used again. The leader of the group was frozen the moment he heard Nira say that, but he still remained firm in his decision to attack the wagon to loot it and capture these women to sell as slaves. He couldn't resist the payday that was staring right at him, and he ignored all logical thought processes. He suddenly charged forth with his men following him, two were immediately cut down by both Nira and Amelia, while the last one got sliced by Ellie. Idiot, Nira said as she looked at their bodies in disgust. Indeed, Amelia agreed as she put away her bow. Is it over? They heard Elias say from inside the wagon. Yep, it's safe now, Ellie replied. The old man slowly jumped down from the wagon and approached the group. Thank you, he said as he got back up onto the front seat. It was our job to protect you, Ellie said. 
I know, she heard him say, I'm just thankful you protected my things. He continued, we have to go, we're burning daylight. Let's drag these corpses to the side of the road and continue with our trip, Nero announced. They started dragging the corpses to be dumped to the side of the road, after which, Nero climbed back on board the wagon as it started moving. While inside, she pat Mothew's small head as the wagon started moving again. Mothew enjoyed the pats as his secondary colors turned to silver again, and he went to take a nap inside Nero's bag. 11. Chapter 45 Arrival to Eris Next, after that little encounter, nothing much happened on the rest of the journey. Another day had just risen, and they continued with their journey. They passed through hills, forests, and finally open plains. They then noticed other wagons starting to appear on the horizon. They passed a couple who were heading out in the direction they once came, probably merchants on their way to trade in Redfield. The clusters of merchants moving to and away from the horizon started coming by the minute, and in a couple of hours they started to see the city of Aris. Its enormous stone wall stood at a very impressive height, much higher than the ones found on Redfield. A moat surrounded the entire city, which was only accessible through large wood and iron doors. Whoa, so this is Aris, huh? Ellie said in awe. Beautiful, isn't it? This city is the capital's lifeline. If Eris stopped providing valuable resources to the capital, this would be the capital instead, Elias, the old merchant, said. Then why is it that Sears is the capital and not Eris? Nera asked from the wagon. It is because Eris is a vital trading hub. It used to be the capital, but the fourth king moved the capital to his hometown, which is in the middle of the kingdom, Elias explained. I see. Nero then looked at the big city in front of them. Being a trade hub city, it was only natural for them to see a long line of traders and merchants waiting to get inside the city. Once it was their turn, a guard wearing iron armor approached their wagon. Present your cards, please, he said with his hand out while he stood in the front seat where Ellie was. Ellie and Elias handed their adventurer's guard and merchant card, respectively. Nero did so as well, but when he reached Amelia, Amelia Brifly showed off her platinum stamped S ranker card, and the guard flinched in surprise. He whispered something to her before examining the other's card. He used a blue crystal that emitted a light to scan the cards, and when it was finished, he nodded and gave the cards back to their respective owners. All right, you're clear. Don't do anything that will upset the nobles in this city, and do not break any laws. He explained as the wagon started moving again and into the nearby stable for the tired horses to rest after the long trip. Nira and Ellie got off the wagon with their things, along with Amelia. Elias walked up to them with a satisfied smile and gave them a quest parchment with a stamp, signifying that they had completed the escort quest. Thank you for protecting me while I traveled here, he said. It was our job, good luck on your goods. Nero replied. The group then left Elias with his own things and moved inward from the city walls. In front of them were a huge amount of people walking around, trying to get to their respective jobs. Large, tall houses made out of wood and some with stone were dotted about, as were various buildings, most likely inns for adventurers, lining the side of the road. The first order of business is to book a nice inn for us to stay in and rest for a bit before heading to the guild branch in here to turn in the escort quest, Nero announced as she turned around to meet the gazes of her friends. Okay, that sounds reasonable, Ellie said nonchalantly with her arms behind her head. I know a perfect spot for us to stay in, Amiria, who is actually Amiria said as she pointed at a nearby inn with a stone foundation, wooden walls, glass windows, and a very elegant looking porch to go with the cozy aesthetic. Are you sure we can afford to stay here? Nira turned to look at Amiria with her brow raised. I am very sure, just trust me. Amiria said as she walked into the inn. Nira and Ellie followed suit. The inside was as cozy as the outside, with many adventurers, like inside a guild, drinking and eating their respective meals. Nera guessed this in specifically catered to the adventuring parties that would visit this city for the same reasons. Please let me do the talking, all right? Amiria said, which received a puzzled expression from the two twins behind her. Nevertheless, they followed her towards the front desk, where a girl with red hair was waiting for them. 
Welcome to the Adventurer's Paradise Inn. Would you like to rent a room? She said with a friendly smile. Anna, it's me, Amiria said as she leaned in to let the girl see her facial features that were hiding under the hood. Em, it's been so long since you last visited. I thought you had already forgotten about me, the girl said, almost fake crying in the end. Yeah, I was a bit held up with the problems of being an S-ranker. I'm here under a very confidential mission, so could you lower the price of the room for us? Amiria said. Boohoo. This is your first time since forever visiting me, and the first thing you ask is for a discount. Am, you're going to make me cry while at work, she said as she leaned dramatically on the counter with her hand above her forehead. Please, Anna, you still owe me from last time, remember? Amiria said. Yeah, yeah. HMPH. The rent will be 50 silver coins instead of a gold coin per person. Happy now? Anna said while she crossed her arms, pouting. Yeah, that'll do. Thank you, Amiria said. Okay, now we're even, she said as she laid three keys on the counter. Nira, Ellie, and Amiria each pulled out 50 silver coins each and grabbed their respective keys. Thank you for choosing our little inn. Please enjoy your stay she said while she regained her friendly smile. All of them went up the stairs and into their each respective rooms to take a break from their long trip. Nera's room was located across from Ellie's room and had carved wooden furniture. The bed was not very big, but big enough to fit a single person. Nir said bed is a large window that overlooks the streets where they were a few minutes ago. To the right was a closet to store her clothes, and next to that was a door that leads to a small washroom and shower. Nira found it all very accommodating for the price of 50 silver coins. So, with extra time on her hands before heading towards the guild, she placed all her clothes inside the closet to make herself at home. Matthew jumped out of her bag to help with Nira's task and was rewarded with garlic bread, much to the small fox's appreciation. System vs. Rebirth Chapter 771 Suspicions One week later, Noel channeled his ice element to Anna's right hand and right foot at the same time. Anna skillfully covered her body with her lightning element and matched the spiritual energy to accept Noel's power. The ice element flowed smoothly on top of her body as if she was just a rock that didn't mind getting frozen by the ice. Yet, this time, the ice element could actually circle around her head stop on her forehead to make a crown, or even create an ice armor. Anna managed to control Noel's ice element to such a degree, as soon as she returned the ice element back, she began channeling her lightning into Noel's body. Noel was even more surprising at this point. Due to the mission task that increased his spiritual energy sensitivity, he managed to easily sense the amount of lightning when it flowed onto his body. The lightning actually jumped around as if it was a rabbit. It moved around Noel's body and even stopped on his shoulder to nudge his cheek as if it were trying to act cute. After that circulation, both of them opened their eyes, staring at each other. Old Rue watched them with a smile. This was the first time he saw people with this much talent. Anna, who had experienced another life, was obviously talented. But Noel was even monstrous. He might start slow but his pace might be even faster than Anna's currently. Now that you have grasped the essence of it, let's begin to do a practice match. You can start off slow. Oldrew raised his hand, gesturing to them to stand up. Noel and Anna nodded, following his instructions. Remember, this is just a practice match. Don't try to harm each other. Well, I don't think you are going to do it, but I'll just remind you about it. You can only attack once before defending. Starts off slow to get the hang of it. Make sure you completely repel your opponent's spiritual energy and element. Anna attacks first. Anna and Noel nodded. They raised their stances. Anna sent forth a fist, but the speed was extremely slow. It seemed that she was matching the speed she needed to increase her spiritual energy and infuse her element before sending it to Noel. Noel also carefully watched her movement and matched her speed. In addition, he raised his right hand to block this. Since Anna would be trying to send the element into his body, he had to let the element flow onto his hand but redirect it to his fingers before releasing it upward. This way, he wouldn't have to endure the sharp jolt from the lightning. The moment her attack connected, she sent the lightning directly onto his body, trying to electrocute his body. However, 
Noel had made his spiritual energy and ice element flow in reverse, causing the lightning to shoot upward. Noel was slightly surprised. In the past, whenever Anna attacked him with his lightning, he would have a hard time blocking it. Only the spiritual weaponry could completely dispel any lingering effect the lightning would cause. In fact, when the people from the Demon Banner Army trained for the first time in the headquarters, they were trained harshly so that they could ignore the lingering effect the enemy might have caused. But for Old Rue, it seemed that he wanted to be completely free from it. That was why this ability was terrifying. Even if they faced a stronger opponent with a more powerful element, they could face them without any fear. Now that he finally understood how terrifying this ability could become, Noel began to concentrate his element into his fist and directly sent it to Anna. Anna also followed what Noel did, skillfully releasing the ice element upward. Good. Continue that way. Once you get used to it, gradually increase the speed. I'm not going to let you leave before you can fight at the speed of a spirit master while maintaining this. Of course, that includes the fact that you're to use spirit abilities and other things. Oldry smiled. Even though he said it lightly, reaching that level would require a lot of time. They didn't know if one month was enough or not. After all, there was a huge gap between their current speed and the level of a spirit master. However, they had no choice but to do it. It was only practical at that level after all. While they were training, Damien couldn't help but remember the time when they fought against Lorthy and the others. Back then, Noel had trouble when fighting against the serpent. She used her poison to endanger the others. While his fire could burn her poison, it would be impossible for the others to replicate his feat. If his teammates managed to learn something like this, they wouldn't have to fear the serpent. Of course, it was impossible to learn this ability so quickly. Hence, Noel was all that mattered. With his current expertise, it shouldn't be hard for him to send the fire on her body, letting it remain to engulf the poison she was emitting. No. He might even be able to cover his teammates with his fire, wrapping them without burning them. If the team could gang up on her, there was no way the group would lose. That was why if the serpent was coming back at them, they would definitely win after Noel learned this technique. His overall ability alone might still not reach the level of a spirit grandmaster, but with the control of his element, he could be considered at the peak of spirit master. Since Noel was determined to finish this training quicker than planned so that he could hunt the demons around and absorb their spiritual energy, Noel might reach the peak of spirit masters this time. When they returned to the kingdom, it wouldn't be weird if he suddenly advanced to spirit grandmaster within the next six months. Anna would definitely do the same, and this would be the birth of the pair of geniuses that would shake the entire world. However, there was something that felt missing in his observation. Damien furrowed his eyebrows for a moment before realizing something. Their friendliness made him forget, but the world knew them to be enemies of each other. Wait a minute, Dimitri. Damien gasped, staring at Dimitri. Did you know this would happen? What do you mean? Dimitri tilted his head in confusion. I'm talking about the fact that they are known to be enemies. If both of them are on the same side, people will think that these two geniuses are going to threaten the royal family. After all, Noel has his family executed by them. On the other hand, if they are on the opposite side, the royal family will think that Anna will be there to suppress Noel. This way, they could prolong their acts and gradually build up their plan. Dimitri only smiled at his revelation while Damien actually managed to see through Noel's little scheme in the previous life. The reason why they could reach that stage without getting betrayed was because they were on the opposite side. While Noel tried to change Anna, he didn't do it too much to the point Anna would be on the same side. They would end up getting besieged from all directions after all. However, it seemed that in this life, Noel had changed his stance, especially after meeting Anna. Nicole was only listening to them, but the revelation was enough to shock her to the core. She obviously knew how the royal family had been trying to suppress the Stargaze family and forced Anna to marry into their royal family. If not for the fact that the Stargaze family was quite strong, Anna would have definitely fallen into their hands. That was why it seemed that Anna and Noel planned to join hands to shake up the entire kingdom. Besieged? They had truly underestimated the power of the Ardigan family and the Stargaze family. There was another reason why Nicole joined the Inquisitor. Of course, she was trying to aim to become an Arbiter. 
but the real reason was that she had to find talented people in the organizations and tried to recruit them. As for Noel's parents, who had been faking their deaths this whole time, no one actually knew what they were planning to do. Of course, there was also a need for Noel to pay back his parents for faking their deaths. Even though he could understand the reason for it, he simply couldn't forgive them for doing something like this without his knowledge. His father might have provided him with life lessons and trained his brain for the sake of rebuilding the family, but it didn't change the fact that prowess was the most necessary preparation. That was why he wanted to infuriate both of his parents and force them to come out of their holes. He wanted to show them that he was the one in charge of the family, not them. However, these were only the suspicions that these three spirit grandmasters had. As for whether it would come up that way, it would depend on Anna and Noel. After all, Anna's information about her previous life coupled with Noel's brain might give a different answer. Chapter 772 Spirit Veins One month later, ha! Huh, Anna shouted while punching Noel in the face. Noel hurriedly raised his left hand to catch it, but Anna poured more spiritual energy that Noel saw at the last minute, causing the imbalance between their spiritual energy. The spiritual energy burst out, producing a shock wave that knocked Noel's back. However, Noel skillfully redirected the shock wave only on his upper body while his lower body remained on the ground. As soon as he was about to fall, he used his other hand to touch the ground supporting his entire body so as to not fall to the ground. At the same time, he kicked Anna's ankle from the left side. Anna tried to jump, but that was when Noel's ice appeared once again. She almost tripped because of this ice. In fact, she had suffered a lot from this frost control ability and remembered that the first time she fell from his trick was when she tackled him. The trick worked because Noel chose such a time to execute it, causing Anna to be unable to leave the ground. In the end, she had to use her own spiritual energy to block it. The clash of their spiritual energy lasted for a second as Noel tried to manipulate his own spiritual energy to outsmart her. However, Anna kept matching the amount of his spiritual energy whenever he increased it. Hence, Noel chose an unorthodox strategy to catch her off guard. Instead of increasing the spiritual energy to overwhelm her, he decreased his own spiritual energy. The result was obvious. Anna ended up knocking him back even though he was the one to attack. Exclamation mark Anna widened her eyes in shock, never expecting Noel to lose deliberately, but she soon understood why he did it. Noel used the momentum that knocked his foot back to spin his body and deliver another kick at her stomach. Kh. Anna caught both shoes, stopping them at the last second. Unfortunately for her, his shoes had been covered with a layer of ice. Specifically, only on the bottom surface. That was why when Anna caught it, Noel simply had to release the ice to leave Anna's grip. Exclamation mark she was confused when she lost the feeling of resistance from Noel, but it turned out Noel had pulled his feet once more and increased the amount of spiritual energy before launching another kick. The kick shattered the ice, and Noel's spiritual energy burst out, knocking her back. Ouch. Are you insane? Anna waved both hands down as if trying to make the numb sensation disappear. If that's someone else, their ribs would have been broken. I did it only because my opponent was you. Noel shrugged. You are the only one who can make me feel safe to try a lot of things, after all. A. Eh? Anna was slightly flustered by his statement, but as one would expect from Noel, he actually took advantage of that split second gap to approach Anna and punch her. However, it seemed that Noel had influenced Anna to the point where she could apply some of his tricks. When Noel's fist was about to reach her, she suddenly spun her body while grabbing his arm before using his momentum to throw him away. Where Noel was shocked as he flew upside down, staring at Anna, who stuck out her tongue. He realized he had been tricked. Anna only acted flustered because she knew he would charge at her. TSK. Noel clicked his tongue. Anna smirked at Noel's frustrated face. Do you think I'll let you beat me up all the time? I already know all your tricks. Noel shouted back. Then I'm going to prepare more tricks that you don't know yet. Sure. I'm looking forward to stealing it and using it against you. Anna didn't seem to be scared. Instead, she had gotten used to this since Noel had been tricking her from her previous life to the current one. Noel landed on the ground after twisting his spiritual energy to spin his body, before he could rush to her again. 
Oldry stopped them. That's enough. You two have been able to fight at spirit practitioner level. There are still spirit wielder and spirit grandmaster levels, but I don't think it will take too long before you master them. So, I'm going to give you one last lesson, said Oldru while waving his hands to both of them. They nodded and walked to Oldru, wondering what she had to say. To be honest, I don't really want to teach you this, considering it's not that useful, especially to Noel. But I think you should know about it. Old Rue glanced at Anna before pointing at his stomach. This place is my spirit seal. Both of you should have leveled up your connection to the spirit link, right? Yes. Noel and Anna nodded without hesitation. Noel only achieved it with Heisk. Not hard again though. Now that you have reached this level, you should be able to feel the spirit link in your body. Noel and Anna furrowed their eyebrows before shutting their eyes. Now that their spiritual energy sensitivity had increased so much. They could sense veins coming out of the spirit seal. The spirit seal looked like a tree that spread its roots in their bodies. This was the connection that Aldrew was talking about. I think I can sense it, Noel and Anna answered at the same time. Those links are connected to your entire body. Try to use your spiritual energy to make a connection with it. Aldrew continued. Understood. Noel and Anna hurriedly infused their spiritual energy, matching the amount with the spirit seal. As expected, they could actually connect with it. Just like how you are connected to other objects, once you connect with the veins, you will be able to reinforce your body and they'll make you even stronger, Oldrew explained. Anna widened her eyes because she saw that the spirit veins began to glow, making her understand what the trick was. This was the ability she showed to Noel before coming here. She didn't know the principle and only tried to replicate it with what she could. But to think it would be related to the spirit link. It was no wonder why someone would get a surge of strength when they used this. It was clear from Anna's reaction that she was already aware of this ability. So, Oldrew ignored the reaction of someone who was in her second life and moved to Noel. There is one fatal problem for you, Noel. From what I can see, you haven't made the spirit link with your second spirit, right? Yes. Noel nodded. Second spirit. Anna looked surprised. Why are you so surprised? You should have figured out something like this, right? I mean, I thought you had twin spirits. In that case, when you made a spirit link, shouldn't you have done it with both spirits at the same time? Anna sighed. Noel paused for a moment. It didn't seem he was planning to hide it, but he also didn't want to easily reveal his secret. So, he said, the two spirits in my body are different. Old Rue shifted the conversation back. In any case, the fatal problem is that I haven't experienced this method with two spirits. Each spirit has its own unique spirit link, and in your case, the moment you create a spirit link with your second spirit, the spirit will definitely create all the veins like that. When that happens, their veins will be interlinked. Those two are different spirits and each spirit has its own unique spiritual energy and element. So, if we look at the theory, it's possible that the energy from both spirit links would cause a reaction and make your body explode. In addition, controlling two different levels of energy inside your body is easier said than done. It's like splitting your brain into two. That's not including the fight against multiple opponents. Noah fell silent, imagining this that Oldrew said. Of course, the spirits should have known about this better, so he asked inwardly, Ardigan, Heisk, what do you think? Everything he said makes sense. We haven't tried it, but there is a possibility it will happen. Heisk replied. Does that mean it's not possible for me to use this? Currently, not. However, there is a method that you might want to try in the future. Ardigan reassured him that there might be a method in the future. Not now? Yes. The method requires Heisk to at least become a humanoid rank spirit. Although our energy levels won't be the same, there shouldn't be a huge gap. Once that happens, you should be able to maintain both spirit links. Of course, it will require a lot of practice, but it should be possible. Now that I think about it, what will I receive from you when we form a spirit link? Noel asked, curious. Unfortunately, it's better not to tell you about it right now because there are probably three things that might come to you but only one will be selected depending on our compatibility. Instead of diverting your focus to prepare for those three, it's better if you just focus on making Heisk a humanoid rank spirit first. 
We'll immediately proceed with the spirit link after that. You should be at least a spirit grandmaster at that time. I see. Noel took a deep breath. As Ardigan said, if he diverted his focus, he would end up slowing down his progress. It was like playing rock paper scissors, so it was useless to worry about it. The fact that it was possible alone was enough for him. Noel looked at Toldrew and said, you don't have to worry about it. Please teach me about this as well. All right then. Old nodded. Chapter 773 Leaving It didn't take too long for Noel and Anna to get accustomed to tracing their spirit link and utilizing it to boost their physical prowess. However, Oldrew mentioned that it was only one of the functions. There was one more hidden function that they had to discover. It didn't take too long for them to realize it. Since the veins flowed to their limbs, it would act as a natural flow. In order words. They could use the spiritual energy that flowed from their spirit seal to their limbs to repel the enemy's attack. These two continued to train under Oldrew at a ridiculous speed. It was already insane that they managed to become a spirit master within two years, but the fact that they would soon become a spirit grandmaster would shock the entire kingdom. Middle dot C theta M time passed by, without them realizing it. Two and a half months ever since they arrived at this place had passed by. Every day was fulfilling to the point where they couldn't think of anything other than training. Of course, the interaction as well as the competition between Noel and Anna made the training less boring, but it didn't change the fact that a long time had passed. In another 45 days, they had to return to the kingdom. Hence, this was a time they should begin the last phase of the training, which was the hunt. Noel and Anna stretched their bodies as this was the first time they fought demons after their training. They didn't know what kind of change it would bring to them. Obviously, the area was extremely dangerous. Dimitri, Damien, and Nicole were worried about them, thinking they would be in danger, but Oldru actually stopped them, saying, You three, I know that you are worried about them, but how about staying here? I'm sure that you've learned a lot over the past few months. You should take some time to sort your thoughts and try your theory, right? But Dimitri was the first one to express his worry. Don't worry. I will go with them. Oldrew waved his hand lightly, reassuring them. They knew that Oldrew was extremely strong. They might not even be able to do anything to him even with a true spirit body. So, after some consideration, Dimitri bowed to him and said, Please take care of him. Them. MHM. Old Ru nodded. Are we going to the valley where we enter here? But we've cleared the area previously. The demons shouldn't have filled the valley, right? Noel asked. Of course. We are going to a different area. At the back of this place, there is a demon nest. The nest is filled with at least a thousand demons with the leader being a superior demon. Your task is to clear the demon nest. Old Ru smiled. As soon as Dimitri heard those words, he immediately retracted his words and shouted, That's extremely dangerous. They are still spirit masters. Do you think they can fight against a superior demon? You are underestimating these two kids. If they fight at the very limit, killing a superior demon should be possible. Old Ru shook his head helplessly. Besides, even if they can't, I can always kill the superior demon, though. I bet that their competitiveness will stop me from doing so. Anna and Noel fell silent. On one hand, they didn't mind fighting against a superior demon. On the other hand, they knew that only a captain could put up a fight against them. Even a spirit grandmaster like Paul would have a hard time stopping them, let alone defeating them. However, they knew that Paul became a spirit grandmaster not long ago. His strength couldn't be compared to a full-fledged spirit grandmaster. When they thought about it, they couldn't help but think it was possible to defeat Paul as long as they worked together. They managed to defeat a spirit master when they were only a spirit wielder after all. So, they might be able to do the same with a spirit grandmaster now that they have become a spirit master. In addition, Anna had the so-called true spirit body. If everything looked dangerous. There was no doubt that she would use this trump card, though. The problem was that once she used it, she would have a hard time training because the connection with her spirit would be extremely thin for a week. In other words, Noel and Anna had to make a decision. The reward was extremely great, but the risk was also high. They couldn't proceed with a half-baked decision. 
Noel and Anna exchanged looks for a minute before nodding their heads. We will go. Noel stopped Dimitri with a determined look. But master. Ro Alpha D Alpha S. New vertical bar om. Dimitri. Noel raised his voice, making his intention clear. Once we return, we are going to face enemies far stronger and more wicked than a superior demon. There will be a lot of spirit grandmasters, if not spirit transcendences. If Anna and I can't even defeat a superior demon, do you think we will be able to face them? It's true that we can rely on you for some time, but have you forgotten about the previous ambush? The enemies have outsmarted us and even sent forth a spirit transcendence to kill us. If not for you using the true spirit body, the loss would be unimaginable. If worrying about my safety is your priority, then you should know that while this training might possess a lot of risks, there is still old Ru acting as a safety net. Meanwhile, if we return with me still weak, there won't be anyone stopping the enemies from killing me again. No, dying in their hands might be salvation. Noel clenched his fists. He knew that with how much Lorfi was obsessed with them, he would definitely be subjected to a lot of humiliations where dying would be better. Now that they had learned this new ability, he wanted to see how far he could go against a superior demon. As long as he could do it, he would have the confidence to go against someone like a devil bishop. That was why he had to go. If you are truly my butler, then, rather than overprotecting me, you should believe in me and wish for a safe journey. Exclamation mark Dimitri's body shook. He couldn't help but remember the time when Noel was still a baby. At that time, Noel looked extremely fragile. A single pinch from him might even kill him. Even though Luke knew he wanted to kill Noel not long ago, Luke actually asked him to carry him. Dimitri didn't know at that time, it was the turning point in his life. When he held him as gently as possible, Noel was actually smiling. Even though he was held by bloodied hands of his, the smile melted everything. Noel even held his thumb as if telling him it was fine. As an assassin, he had taken a lot of lives under the commander's command. Most of the time, the target of assassination would have someone they held dear. Every time he took their lives, those behind them would cry. That was why these bloodied hands of his couldn't hold something precious. The only thing they did was take away people's happiness. And it was at this moment he thought that his hands might be able to bring something new. Instead of doing it to take people's lives and make others sad, he might be able to protect this precious smile. Luke, his father had done a lot of good deeds that brought smiles to people's faces, so this little baby might also bring a lot of smiles to people. In his heart, he wanted to protect this smile. He wanted to protect this little life. Also that when he grew up, he would bring joy to others. When that happened, he would know that he had done a good deed. Now that Noel stood in front of him with that determined look as if telling him that he didn't need his protection anymore. He felt that this might be the time to stop. Noel had grown up, yet, as if Noel understood his feeling, Noel came to him and said, You have been protecting me a lot this whole time. I'm eternally grateful for it. However, if I keep relying on you to protect me, there will be a time when we won't be together. If I can't even protect myself, then what should I do? Of course, I'm just asking you to trust me this time. There are still a lot of things you have to teach me, so, please trust me this time. Noel knew that the last time they got ambushed by Lorfi had traumatized Dimitri a bit. He knew that Dimitri wouldn't always be with him. There was a time when he had to stand up, telling him that it was fine. Dimitri shut his eyes and clenched his fists. There were a lot of things to say, but the only thing that came out of his mouth was, I apologize, master, I was rude. There was a thin line between protecting someone and not trusting them. He slightly leaned to the latter, thinking Noel wouldn't be able to do anything without him. That was why he apologized for his rudeness. Noel smiled. Don't worry. I will be back soon. Yes. May the fortune bless you with its presence. Dimitri nodded. Looking at their interaction, Anna couldn't help but look at Nicole while pointing at herself, asking whether she had anything to say to her. Unfortunately, Nicole could only shake her head and shoulder, not knowing what to say. Let's go then. Old Rue decided to break the silence, or the situation would become awkward. Walker of the Worlds. Chapter 1751 Rising Reputation. Arg. No, my legs. 
Before the immortals could realize it, a barrage of arrows struck them. These were the fiery arrows that Lin Mu had shot. Some of the arrows directly pierced through the bodies of the immortals, while some exploded upon contact. The ones that did explode, greatly injured the immortals, turning them into sitting ducks. Lin Mu had made sure to vary the effects of the arrows so that the immortals wouldn't be able to react to them properly. If they didn't know what the arrow did, they would make wrong predictions and end up getting greatly injured, which was exactly what had happened. Tilda Shwa 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 Tilda Three immortals quickly turned into wisps of light and disappeared. Having been teleported out, two more under my belt, Lu Xu said, seeing that his score had increased. I'll take the lead again soon. Kian Wen said as he swung his sword vertically, sending out a long sword light that split the ground part. Watch out! A third tribulation stage immortal could not react in time and was struck by it, quickly being set out of the spatial plane. Now we're equal, Kian Wen said with a smirk before continuing to slash. Tilda Twang Tilda, Lin Mu also continued to shoot arrows, not letting the immortals rest. Tilda Howl Tilda. But that wasn't all as the Sky Saw Wolf also joined the battle under the commands of Ming Lian. Tilda wished Tilda, unlike the Immortals, Ting had superior mobility due to having wings and could still fly. She swooped in from the sky and clawed at the cultivators, ripping their flesh. There's a flying beast too. Kill it first. We won't be able to fight with it interfering. A fourth tribulation stage Immortal shouted while running. ARGH. But in the next second. He found himself getting injured as well slash. He looked down and saw that one of his legs had been broken. It had sunken into the ground up to his knee. This had happened suddenly, causing his momentum to break his leg. He couldn't tell how this had happened though, as the ground was still solid just a moment ago. Tilda you good good Tilda. Tilda tremble Tilda. The ground is sinking. The other immortals realized as well. Many of them found their legs getting stuck in ground. Some tried to forcefully push them out, while a couple used footwork techniques to avoid sinking into the ground. But it still opened them up to more attacks from Lu Xu and Kian Wen. Tilda boom 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 tilde. Lin Mu's arrows also continued to rain, bombarding the immortals and injuring them further. Tilda shwa 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 tilde. Four more immortals were defeated. Before being teleported out of the spatial plane, Lin Mu and his companions had the coordination that could not be easily seen in a tournament like this. The immortals that had intruded into the formation ring were confused about how many enemies they had to face in the first place. They could only see Lu Xu, Qian Wen and Ting in the open as these were the ones that were clashing with them directly. This led them to believe there were at least four immortals. But the sudden change in the ground was another thing that baffled them. They wondered if it was the work of formations too, but it was simply too strong for it to be able to trap immortals this easily. Of course, they didn't know that there were in reality five people that were fighting together. Lin Mu's plan, along with the tactics he had decided upon, was working perfectly. As the immortals continued to lose one after the other, Lu Xu and Qian Wen kept on dealing the final blows, while the arrows and the mulch crawl eat her beast's skill trapped them. The threat of the sky saw a wolf looming above them was also a great pain, as they wouldn't know when it would attack. The wolf would suddenly strike, then fly away before striking again at the most opportune moment. With this repeating several times, even the fourth tribulation stage immortals started to fall under the combined onslaught of Lin Mu's companions. Luke Zhu, Qian Wen and the Ming sisters found it to be surreal as they defeated multiple opponents that were above their cultivation base. It was something they wouldn't have been able to do normally, but now they were setting a new record for themselves. And it wasn't just them that were amazed by this. Outside the spatial plane, the audience that was watching it all was stunned too. Just who are these people? How can someone set up a formation like that in such a short period of time? Forget that, have you seen beasts act like that before? And those arrows, how can he use such a strong chi skill without having exhausted all his immortal chi? The audience had many questions but could not get the answers. A few among them who had seen the battles of Lin Mu and his companions though were soon starting to recognize them. 
the word about their skills and previous battles was already starting to spread. Even the booking pavilion had to change their opinion of Lin Mu and his companions. While they were weaker than most in terms of pure cultivation base, they still seemed to be coming out on top in terms of other aspects. The best example of this was Lin Mu who was only at the second tribulation stage of the immortal realm in terms of his cheek cultivation. His body cultivation was still unknown, as he hadn't truly displayed the full power of it. Wait, I know that guy. In one of the sitting areas, an audience member shouted, He's the one who intimidated and kicked out Li Lao with merely his aura. There was someone that recognized Lin Mu from the banquet. What? Is that why Li Lao couldn't perform well afterward? Did he receive any patronage from the nobles? The people were now curious about it. After all, an exceptional person like this should have been scouted already. Chapter 1752 Wildfire Approaches While the audience marveled at Lin Mu and his companions, they were now close to wiping out all the immortals. Tilda Boom Tilda. Another barrage of arrows rained down from the sky, blasting the ground and injuring the last three immortals that were still left. All three of them were at the fourth tribulation stage of the immortal realm and were already injured. The explosion from the arrows had further weakened them, allowing Lu Xu and Qian Wen to wipe them out with ease. You will all face defeat at the hands of child before the last immortal could finish his words though. Lu Xu struck him with his spear turning him into a flash of light. As if we didn't hear that already, Lu Xu shook his head, they already knew that child wildfire was the one behind this wave of immortals that had come towards them, the immortals had tried to threaten them using the name of the top ranker, but it was unless, as they didn't have fear of the man with Lin Mu by their side, they were ready to face anything. For now though, a moment of peace was obtained. Is that all them? Ming Alien asked, not seeing any more cultivators. It should be, Qian Wen replied. Are there more coming from the outside, Brother Mu Lin? He asked. No. Seems like we are done with them, Lin Mu replied, his immortal sense trying to search for other cultivators. What about Child Wildfire? Ming Dandan inquired. I can still feel the immortal chi fluctuations coming from him. Though they are of the same level, Lin Mu replied. He might still be watching us, Lu Xu said furrowing his brows, perhaps he's expecting that the formations would be broken if all the immortals charged in and defeated whoever had set it up, Qian Wen guessed, how long do you think it'll take for him to realize he's wrong, Ming Alien wondered, whatever it might be, you all should take this time to recover as much as you can, Lin Mu said knowing that the situation could change at any moment, unlike him, Lu Xu, Qian Wen and the Ming sisters didn't have high stores of immortal qi, Lu Xu and Qian Wen were the ones who had fought directly and thus had used the most immortal qi, Ming Alien and Ming Dandan might not have expended much of their own immortal qi, but their tamed beasts certainly had, the mulch crawl eater beast was exhausted and had used up nearly 80% of its immortal qi in order to use its skill to turn the ground into a swamp. It had converted a large area of land into a swamp and had maintained it all this time too, which had led to a greater drain. Even the sky saw wolf had used up nearly half of its immortal chi in the battle. Ting was flying at her maximum speed, which did use up more immortal chi after all, and since the Ming sisters couldn't fight themselves, it basically meant that their condition may as well be the condition of their tamed beasts. We'll try to recover. Lu Xu said as he took out immortal stones, Qian Wen did the same, while the Ming sisters gave their immortal stones to their beasts, they would try their best to recover their immortal qi, while Lin Mu continued to keep a watch. He was the one in the best condition as he had barely used 5% of his immortal qi even with a constant barrage of attacks. Wonder Seeker was a great help in it, as the bow could reduce his consumption of immortal chi by supplementing it with its own. This was the advantage of having a high-grade immortal weapon, as it could think for itself and adequately support its owner. Not only were Lin Mu's attacks amplified, his consumption of immortal chi was also lowered, raising the overall efficiency of his attacks. Lin Mu watched the skies with his spatial perception active, trying to see how the condition of the other spatial plane was still intact. There doesn't seem to be any sign of it closing right now. Lin Mu thought after observing it. If the spatial plane closed up, 
it would mean that Lin Mu would be free to pursue the remaining immortals in the spatial plane, but since it was still existing, it meant he needed to wait longer. Minute after minute passed, as Lin Mu kept a sharp eye on everything, his companions were trying to recover, but their speed of recovery wasn't as fast as Lin Mu, tilde hung tilde, but just ten minutes later, Lin Mu felt a wave of energy coming from afar, it prompted him to open his eyes and become alert, looks like he can't hold back anymore, Lin Mu muttered as he gazed in the distance over ten kilometers away, a black-robed man was walking in a field of fire, with every step that he took, the fire continued to spread and a field of flames was created for some reason, the fire didn't extinguish even after he had walked past an area and continued to burn, the flames looked to be of the same color as normal flames, but the heat coming from them was far greater than that, it was like the concentrated heat from a forge that scorched one's skin with just a single exposure. The man had an expressionless face and seemed to be walking without to care in the world, though the aura that was emanating from him said otherwise, it was like that of a volcano that seemed to be on the verge of exploding, every step of his seemed to cause a faint rumbling, while the temperature of the area continued to rise, at first, the steps seemed to be slow, but after a minute or so, it was as if they had turned into a blur, a kilometer of area was passed in a minute the man gliding over the land as if it were snow, title, Alpha Strike Arc 3, 00-08, Bio Samayu, Book 1, Arc 3 Prologue, Unnatural Selection, Alagan returned to the group just as Kalik was finished treating the last of them, he looked down at the young herbalist girl lying down in front of Kalik and frowned, other than Zolzaya and Gambata, the other four survivors, you two included, were all still unconscious, Alagan frowned and asked the grass redder, how are they, Kalik shook her head, not great, but they'll live, whatever you two, or maybe the elemental, did, it took the brunt of the lord protector's attack, the backlash of it, at least, we need to get them to the village as soon as possible, you two, in particular, needs better treatment than he can provide here, how, huh? how did it look, outside, I mean, Alagan turned to look at the Lord Protector, whose body was slowly returning to its former shape, it should be safe, I doubt anything in the surrounding area survived, even if they did, only a fool wouldn't turn and run after seeing something like that, Kalik nodded, though Ganbeta spoke next, having wandered over after noticing Alagan's return, and Kusanagi, the group hadn't seen the Beast Lord, but they'd heard it when he finally showed himself after U2's surprise attack. Alagan paused before answering. Dead. There's no way he survived that kind of blow. As one, the group let out a sigh of relief. They shared a moment of silence in remembrance of those they'd lost before Kalik spoke. Even so, we need to report this as soon as possible. The wandering cities, and the Eclit, need to know what has happened here today. Ganna tilted his head and asked. But why? The Beast Lord is dead, this is the end, isn't it? Why the rush? Solzaya was the one to answer, though she never turned to face them. Because the Beast Lord wasn't working alone, was he? Alagan and Ganna turned to Zolzaya. Their eyes wide, Ganna stuttered as he spoke. But, that, that doesn't make, it makes perfect sense. Solzaya cut him off with her voice raised. She turned to face him and continued, think about it. How did Kusanagi gather so many grassbreakers with no one noticing? How did he take down an entire Eclit party? Why did he even know where they would be? With a softer voice, she turned and looked at the still form of Yutu. Where did he get the poison? Gana tried to respond, but no answers came to his mind. After a moment of silence, Alagan spoke. Gather what supplies can be salvaged. I'll speak to the Lord Protector. Hopefully, with his help. We'll make it to the Earth Shrine before whatever allies the Beast Lord have learned of his fate. The group nodded, but before they could move, a loud ruckus began. Fearing another attack, the group moved closer and turned. Instead of a new enemy, they found the Lord Protector, who had returned to his original form, frantically unturning and digging through the rubble. Ganna frowned as he asked. What is he? Solza cut him off, though her voice low, guys, the other three turned to face her, noticing she'd gone white as snow, in almost a whisper, 
she continued. When was the last time any of you saw the Eclid up? All three humans' eyes went wide. Ganna and Ulagan rushed to the Lord Protector's side and started clearing what rubble they could reach, while Kalak sighed, rubbing her temple. Solzaya watched the two men and the large spirit beast clearing the debris at a rapid pace, but something in her gut told her they wouldn't find anything. Well, she, the glare from her mentor snapped her mouth shut before she could finish the thought. Equals 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 equals. Archimedes popped from the group, coughing up a pool of blood, his entire body convulsed, and he felt like he was on fire despite the cold sweat pouring off him. What the hell was that? What the hell had that been? There had been nothing about that. That thing mentioned in the report. He'd been told it was a simple job. Slip in while no one was looking, nab the child, and make a break for it. No one had told him something like that would be there. Were the people who hired him psychotic? How in the nine hells did they expect this to end well for them? More importantly, would he be dragged into this mess? His eyes drifted to the still struggling bundle of cloth beside him. For what felt like the hundredth time that hour, he contemplated dumping the cursed child in a ditch somewhere and making a break for it. The mission be damned. But he knew he couldn't do it. The camp was not forgiving of deserters. More so when their clients had such backing. If he abandoned the job, his name would be next on the list. Yet, some part of him questioned if it was worth it all. Why so much trouble for a single pup? He threw several medical pills into his mouth and bit down, washing them down with a swig from his canteen. He shivered as the powerful medicine took effect. Most adventurers might have considered the camp a dark guild, but they took care of their people. At least, he could never afford such pills on his own. Then again, it wasn't really the camp paying for them. Anyway, they always passed on the cost of supplies for a mission to the customer. Hey, that's the price you paid when you needed something more. Dirty done. Archimedes rolled his shoulders and picked up the wiggling bundle. Whether you need a mercenary team that wouldn't ask questions or a group of bandits to target a rival's caravan, the camp would have what you need. Kidnappings happen to be Archimedes' specialty. There was just something so satisfying about snatching some poor unsuspecting sob right out from under someone's nose. It was like a puzzle, figuring out when and where to strike and, more importantly, how to get away unnoticed. He'd even had specially designed, sealing cloth, made. It would not only seal a target's spirit energy but block out any external tracking attempts. It didn't matter what the enemy used, sound, scent, spirit, or soul markers the cloth would block them all. While it wasn't his only tool, it had been a major factor in his success as one of the best kidnappers on the Skybreaker continent. It was also why his latest client had approached him for this job. Though he had to admit, this was the first time he'd ever been asked to retrieve a kidnapping victim. That had been an interesting twist, though Archimedes had been disappointed by his peers. He'd been impressed when they told him someone had actually kidnapped an Eclid up. That wasn't a simple job in the slightest, but the reality of the situation had been stranger than he expected. They didn't even have the pup tied up. It was just running around without a care in the world. Hell, he wasn't fully convinced the stupid thing hadn't just been tricked into following them with some meat or something. The sudden attack by the army of grassbreakers had been a lucky break, even if the timing was suspicious. But Archimedes thought little of it and bided his time. Then the world went to the Nine Hells. Archimedes didn't know what that attack the strange metal spirit beast had used was, but it had shaken him to his core and nearly killed him outright. He'd even wasted a defensive tool. He'd sure as hell have the client replace that too. Thankfully, though, that tool gave him the chance he needed. While the others were reeling from the backlash of the attack, Archimedes pounced, snatching up the pup and making his escape. That had been several hours now and with no sign of pursuit. It looked like he was in the home stretch. Now, he had to return to the meeting location with the pup and collect his payment. Then it was off to Halle Rosa for a well-deserved vacation. Archimedes checked his, positioning Jade, and then turned in the direction he needed to go but froze. Only a dozen meters away, a large grassbreaker penguin stared up at him still half buried in the ground. Archimedes narrowed his eyes and tilted his head. It was a big one, too, likely a flock leader. 
Was it a penguin that had escaped the blast? He figured it didn't really matter. A grass breaker core would fetch a pittance, even a flock leaders, but it would be some pocket change to play around with later. The man slid his bundle to the ground and slowly approached the penguin, limping slightly, his blade hidden behind his back. Flock leaders were smarter than most, but they were still dumb birds. If he approached too aggressively, it would flee. But if he pretended to be hurt, it would take the chance for an easy meal, giving him the opening he needed to kill it in a single swipe. However, when Archimedes drew within a few meters, something flashed across his vision. He froze, a sudden pinching in his chest making him furrow his brow. His vision wavered slightly as he looked down to find a wrist-thick barbed tentacle sticking out of his chest. The tentacle twitched and retracted back into the open mouth of the grassbreaker. Archimedes stared at the gaping hole where his heart should be, then collapsed to his knees before toppling to his side. As the darknesses crept over his vision, Archimedes saw grassbreaker strolling past him toward the wiggling bundle behind him. As it did, its form twisted and shifted from a large flock leader to an elegantly dressed older human man. The penguin turned man dressed in a fine suit, stared down at the small bundle and stroked his thick, black and white peppered beard. His eyes narrowed, and he pulled out a small black amulet from his coat pocket. He let the amulet hang loose in the air, then channeled some spirit energy through it. It swung wildly for a moment before snapping into place, pointing directly at the cloth-wrapped bundle. The old man sighed and returned the amulet to his pocket before mumbling to himself. So. It seems the young master was correct. Who would have thought even you could be so cruel, Matiz? No matter. With that, he picked the bundle up and walked away. As he did so, Archimedes reached out with a blood-stained hand and grabbed the man's ankle. The old man looked down at the dying kidnapper and Tsket, kicking himself free from the man's weak grip before walking a few more meters and sinking into the ground. Once the man was gone. Archimedes coughed a bloody laugh and pulled out a small ring. With the last of his strength, he smeared his blood on the ring's surface and crushed his, positioning Jade. Archimedes gave a blood-smeared smile and mumbled, Bloody fool. Then the light fled his eyes. Equals 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 equals. An hour later, a masked figure materialized from the wind beside Archimedes' stiff body. Silently. The figure pushed the stiff body over and examined the wound before doing the same to the rest of the field. Finding nothing more, they pulled out a large string of bright red beads and performed several hand seals, channeling spirit energy through them. The air wavered, and a thick mist formed in the area. Inside the mist, figures moved, though no details or sound could be seen. They perfectly mimicked the events of an hour past. The masked figure watched with interest making notes as needed. A short while later, the mists dissipated, and the masked figure returned to Archimedes' body, stripping it of several items and collecting the bloody ring. The figure channeled more spirit energy into the ring and smiled under their mask at the results. Archimedes had never been the most talented or even smartest of them, but one thing could be said for sure. He had definitely been the pettiest. A gust of wind blew through the clearing, and like a drawing in the dust, the masked figure vanished. 22. Book 1, Lesson 31, Chose Your Path Wisely, Alpha had to confess. He may have panicked a little. Sure, for a child, Snowball had shown herself to be highly competent and able to care for herself, but she was still a child. Besides, with her ever-growing self-awareness, and the general respect the humans showed for the small whale puppy, Alpha was fairly certain her species was sapient at this point. A few Federation species didn't become fully sapient until later in life as well, so that wasn't much of a surprise. No, the biggest issue was that Alpha could be fined. As a sapient child, technically under his care, Alpha was legally obligated as a soldier under Federation law to ensure their safety until they could be passed on to proper caregivers. Failure to do so came with stiff penalties and heavy fines. General Hall Dorther was particularly strict about this rule. Willful neglect could see a soldier cleaning carrier ships by hand, and some of those were legally classified as small planetoids. Neglect such as firing a class 5 kinetic warhead within 200 meters of said child. Okay, 
Maybe Alpha was a little worried about the bloodthirsty goofball too. She reminded him of him. The anomaly with the railjack had only scrambled his senses for a short while. But as anyone with a child could tell you, that's all it takes for them to get into some new trouble. Even the tracking beacon he'd tagged her with wasn't sending a signal, which was strange. It should have been working fine, even if she was buried under a mile of rubble. So then, what was blocking it? It took two hours to clear all the rubble in the main building with the help of Alagan and Gambata, but even they couldn't find hide nor hair of her. What they had found was a torn, bloody cloak none of them recognized. Kalik had examined the cloak, plucked at several burned-out symbols woven into the fabric, then used a word Alpha didn't have a record of yet. A quick analysis of the blood showed it was human, though not belonging to any of the humans present. It didn't take a genius to connect the dots, and soon the group was discussing their next course of action. Thankfully, Alpha's lexicon was at a point he could understand most of it. One of the humans Alpha didn't have a name for yet, had been running Alpha through what he assumed was grammar for children during the hours before the attack, presumably, at the request of Kalik. Much of it was still educated guesswork, but it was enough to at least communicate. Kalik, Gambata, Alagan and Zolzar, the only humans able to move, gathered in a small circle near Alpha to speak. Ganbetta was the first to ask. So, what do we do now? Kalik sighed and shook her head. The only thing we can do. What we originally planned. We head to the Earth Shrine and report to the, dollar dollar at hash percent. Alagan frowned and asked, is that wise? Should we not look for the child? There, dollar dollar at hash percent, are not known for their forgiveness. If they learn we abandoned one of their children to an unknown fate, the consequences could be extreme. Alpha filed a new word, a clit, away. He was unsure if that was the name of Snowball's species, tribe, or family, but any information could be important later. It also confirmed, or at least suggested, that Snowball's people had some measure of influence among the humans of this area. Otherwise, why would they be so fearful of retaliation? All the more reason to continue the search. The ore he'd taken from the crates would go a long way toward his recovery, but he only had time to refine a small amount before the penguins showed up. So an in with an established power would make Alpha's job far easier both in the short and long term. Alpha said as much too, I agree. It was only two simple words, but most of the group jumped turning to look at Alva with wide eyes. Only Kalik showed no reaction other than a slight smile. She turned to Alpha and bowed, placing her fist in a cupped hand as she spoke. Lord Protector, Alpha still got a kick out of their title for him. He decided not to correct them just yet. I understand you're worried for the child, but I must beg for your understanding. We have people that need immediate treatment and have no way of telling who has taken the child or where. She then raised the bloody cloak and continued, the eclit, the child's family, may have, and percent and dollar hash at percent, or, dollar hash at percent, that could help to track her or her kidnapper. If we searched for her ourselves, we could waste valuable time. Our best option to ensure the child returns home is to inform their family of what has happened. Alpha considered the older woman's words. She wasn't wrong. With his tracker being blocked by something, they didn't really have a way of finding where the child had been taken. He could do a fanning search with wasps, but without knowing which direction they had gone, that would be a time-consuming process. Besides, whoever it was had somehow slipped past his wasps once, who was to say they couldn't do so again. Conversely, Kalik seemed confident that the child's family could find her through some means, likely some more magical bullcrap, the Torp's optical sensor plate world as he spoke, making the group twitch. Understood, few, being the mysterious man of few words, was exhausting. Kalik let out a breath she didn't know she was holding before giving the AI a nervous smile and responding. Thank you for understanding. Solzaya was the next to speak. Do we even know where we are? I've never heard of an abandoned temple like this. The only earth temple I was even aware of was in the heart. Oh. Alpha knew that one. His optical sensors flashed, and a holographic map of the surrounding area and their previous route appeared in the middle of the group. Once more, the group jumped, and if anyone asked if Alpha was doing it on purpose at this point, he would adamantly agree. 
Kalik's eyes flickered to Alpha before turning to the 3D light map. She circled it, examining it from every direction as if looking for something. After a moment, she stopped and spoke. There, I recognize this stretch. She jerked back as her finger brushed a map section, leaving a small red dot. She stared at her finger for a moment before continuing. This is part of a disputed foraging site between their percent at hash percent village and our own. If this map is accurate, we should only be roughly 70 exclamation mark at hash dollar away from the slate walker trail if we head in this direction from the red dot. Kalik drew a line heading northeast. Based on the Lord Protector's previous speed, we should be able to reach the village by nightfall. Once there, we can drop off the wounded and then make our way to the Earth Shrine to give our report. It took only a few more moments to complete the plan, and the group broke off to do their part, of which Alpha's involved standing around doing nothing. Instead, he wandered off to do something he'd wanted to for a while now, but never had the time. Equals 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 equals. Finding a chunk of the strange, growing copper still intact enough for Alpha's purposes took almost an hour, despite an entire forest of the stuff having grown from seemingly nothing. The railjack had turned most of it into useless slag. Theoretically, he could have refined most of it, but he had little use for so much copper, and the time it would take made it unfeasible, as they would leave the area soon. What little wasn't slag had been contaminated by penguin. Bits. Alpha made a note to ask Kalik about the strange entity that had used the young man, you two, to perform such an act. If he could learn the principle behind it and apply it to other materials, it could solve his resource problems. Nothing good ever came easy, however, and the small amount of untainted, viable copper sample he'd been able to collect proved to be disappointing. Basic scans showed that the substance wasn't really copper. Instead, it was some kind of biometallic compound. Its properties were remarkably similar, though, sharing the same conductivity, malleability, ductility, and even density as mundane copper. Unfortunately, heat tests showed it wouldn't melt in the same way. Instead, it seemed to burn up and crumble under extreme heat, though it took significantly higher temperatures to do that than it would to melt mundane copper. Alpha even found a few pieces would start to regrow back into their original shape when damaged in such a way. What were they even feeding on? If he just left this here and came back in six months, would he find a mountain of tumorous copper? Or was there a natural limit in scope or time? Part of him imagined raining down copper bullets on an advancing army, but quickly dismissed the idea. The copper had taken quite a while to spread through you to in that fashion. The wound would probably kill an enemy long before the copper itself did. True, the entity had created the copper forest in a flash, but something told Alpha was more of the entity's doing rather than some intrinsic nature of the bio copper. <laughs> Maybe he could turn it into a nano printer if he figured out exactly how it was generating mass, and he could replicate or speed up the process safely. It could replace the MCDs. Not to mention the other areas where self-repairing metals could be useful. With that in mind, Alpha collected several of the best samples and shoved them into a stasis container. As Alpha headed back to what remained of the temple building, he couldn't help but daydream about what else he might find in this strange place. Equals 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 equals. Jewetan stood atop the tower cart and looked over the multicolored prairies. The structure swayed with the carts, a trait needed when building such a tall structure on a moving platform. Some guardians never got used to the motion, but Jewerton enjoyed it. It reminded him of his other home, far to the north, where the city boats traveled the icy seas. His new home was a different kind of sea, but it was no less beautiful to him. Jewerton had traveled to this land seeking his history. It was said the clans of the Radiant Sea and his homeland shared some connection, though from a time so long ago that no living person knew what. What he had found was a people of strange ways in a place that he had no proper words for. Nonetheless, he'd fallen in love with the Radiant Sea and its strange people. One person in particular had captured his heart, though she could be abrasive, sometimes, he would freely admit. He'd come searching for answers to questions that plagued him and instead found a peace he never thought he would have or even deserved. He'd built a home, 
and a family, from the ashes of the past, and he'd never regretted a moment of it. A loud snore broke him from his contemplations, and he turned to see the young man beside him, asleep on his feet, leaning dangerously on his spear. Jewerton frowned and flicked the bottom of his own spear into the young guardian's shine. The boy jumped, gripping his spear a little too tightly as he nervously looked around. Seeing nothing but the older man frowning at him, the young guardian humped and turned away. Jewerton sighed. Of course, the boy thought he could laze around with Jewett and the simple when on guard duty. But then again, that was possibly why the captain had paired the boy with him. To begin with, these work behind the ears guardians, fresh from their graduation exam, soon learned that Jewerton wasn't as lenient as the rumors made him out to be. Jewerton had seen too many young guardians and villagers killed because someone decided they could nap on duty. This last batch was even worse. Half of them shouldn't have ever passed. Most of the examination groups had returned almost a week early because of the ruckus surrounding the fallen star. The examiners rightly chose to head home rather than deal with whatever trouble was stirred up by the once in a decade event. The increased security concerns saw the elders handing out blanket passes just to fill in the needed numbers. Well, most of them had. Even days after the last group had returned, one group was still missing. Jewerton turned his eyes back to the vast open expanse before him, desperately searching for any sign of an approaching caravan. His wife had shut herself in their cart for days, refusing to eat and barely speaking. Jewerton still had hope, though that he would see the grass part and the final group return, whole and well at any moment. Some part of him knew that was foolish, but he couldn't let that spark die, not yet. He'd volunteer for tower duty for the entire month if he had to. Movement from behind drew his attention from the horizon, and Rejewerton turned to find his junior partner staring, wide-eyed, toward the west. Jewerton turned that way and froze. Smoke rose from the grasses far into the distance. Not just any smoke, though, purple smoke mixed with red, the signal of a returning party. And a request for help. Jewerton barely heard the young man's voice as he leapt the full thirty meters from the top of the top to the ground below. He hit the ground and rolled, springing into the run that threw up a cloud of dust in his wake. As he weaved between the carts, quickly leaving the village behind. He barely noticed the three other guardians who fell into step beside him, with the kind of speed only achievable with Mind Stage, Silver Spirit, Cultivation. The small group quickly closed on the smoke signal. In his heart, Jiotan prayed to the sister above that what they found wasn't too bad. 20. Book 1, Lesson 32 Take time to rest and recover. The children let loose terror-filled screeches as the beast broke into the small clearing. This wasn't the first time it had found their hiding spot, it had already claimed many of them. Yet, it would not be sated until every tiny human fell. It locked onto the smallest and slowest of the bunch and moved. With a blur of motion, the child disappeared. Those that remained scattered into the surrounding grass each praying they wouldn't be next. If they could just hold out a little longer, just keep away for a few more minutes. A soul-piercing screech from somewhere in the grass signaled another loss. The young boy crawled along the ground, making himself as small and quiet as possible. A hard thing to do with every movement rushed the tall grass around him. But staying still wasn't an option either. They tried that already. Nevertheless, the beast had found them. Somehow, they had to just keep moving. If they kept moving, then, the grass to his left rustled, and the boy froze. A moment later, a young girl, only a year or two young than him, stumbled from the grass, panting, sweat dripping down her face. She stopped, frozen, staring down at him, wide-eyed, then muttered, Oh, no. The next instance, she was gone, disappearing into the grass as something yanked her from behind. The young boy's breaths came in ragged breaths and his heart pounded like thunder in his chest as he stared at the place where the girl had vanished. He knew he should run, should try to hide, but his mind was blank. When his legs, at last, started listening to his head again, it was already too late. An enormous shadow slowly appeared from the tall grass, moving far quieter than something that large ever had the right to. Slowly, it approached, drawing out the moment. The young boy was the last and its victory was all but assured. When it finally loomed over the boy, it stared down at him with its three glowing red eyes and laughed. 
But as the beast reached out, its metallic hand and the young boy gave in to his fate, a loud whistle cut through the silence, and a masculine voice called out, Time, the gargantuan metal beast collapsed to the group, deflating in defeat. With a roaring cheer, the gaggle of children on its back slid down and rushed the young boy, lifting him on their shoulders. It had taken nearly six tries, but they'd finally won victory. Equals 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 equals. Solzaya watched the nearly three dozen children climb over the collapsed Lord Protector like he was the world's biggest playground and shook her head. The other adults of the village, watching the scene, smiled and laughed, likely thinking how funny it was that even a powerful spirit beast was no match for the energy of small children. Zolzaya knew the truth, though, he was pouting. Sure, the Lord Protector had gone easy on the kids, but he had honestly put effort into their game. Even so, determined children's adaptability and quick wit weren't to be underestimated. It helped that the children had been playing this same game for years now, it was part of the basic training, preparing them for their eventual apprenticeships in a few short years. Typically, one of the older guardians played the role of the hunter, but one thing had led to another. The survivors' homecoming has been hectic, to put it lightly. They discussed whether to leave the Lord Protector out of sight before approaching the village to prevent misunderstandings, but after talking, they agreed it was better he be seen with them. Who knew what would happen if he were seen wandering around the outskirts of the village? Of course, that didn't stop Zolzai's father from bursting from the grass filled with a fiery rage she'd never thought him capable of. Jewetton had charged, then struck out at the Lord Protector with the full force of a well-established, mid-stage, silver spirit, cultivator before anyone could warn the man. It seemed Solzaya had inherited more than just her gift from her father. Of course, the Guardian's attack had about as much effect on the Lord Protector as Solzaya's own attack had, even when three other Guardians erupted from the grass. Their combined strength couldn't break the strange energy shield surrounding the spirit beast. Solzaya's heart sank when she heard the cracks of thunder from the Lord Protector, and she feared the worst. Yet, instead of the space of blood she expected, all four guardians doubled over, clutching their abdomens as if they'd been struck by a mighty fist. When one fell over on his side, and Solzaya saw the fist-sized dent in the man's chest plate, she realized she hadn't been too far off. Silently, she thanked the Lord Protector for his restraint. While such a blow would leave a massive bruise, she was sure one guardian even had a cracked rib, she knew its thunderous attack could do far worse. The next few moments had been part heartwarming reunion and part emergency medical treatment as the group helped the injured guardians out of their dented armor. A quick debriefing from Ulagan and an all-clear signal sent to the village saw the four guardians kowtowing before the Lord Protector. Solzaya's gift told her the creature was more amused than insulted, but she kept that to herself. Men's pride could be a fragile thing, after all. The guardians had then escorted the group back to the village followed by the expected confusion, fear, and excitement as the village rushed to meet the survivors of the last group. That excitement soon turned to mournful wailing as it became clear they were returning with not even a third of the number they'd left with. The following day had been a typical song and dance as the story circulated through the village. Everyone wanted to know what had happened, and some even tried to blame the Lord Protector, either for not saving their own family member or somehow having planned the whole thing. The elders, to appease the villagers, placed a guard on the mysterious spirit beast, a full twelve, silver spirit, guardians, led by the captain himself, the only, gold spirit, cultivator in the village. Not that any of the leadership believed they could do anything against the creature, of course, after Ulagan and Kallik's retelling of events but had kept the people at ease. Somewhat, the Lord Protector, for his part, had been surprisingly cooperative during the entire ordeal. Ulagan and others thought the spirit beast was passive and aloof, but Zolzai knew the truth. The creature was extremely calculating, and everything it did was for a purpose. Even this air of indifference and helpful nature was all for a goal. It needed them for something. But Solzaya's gift couldn't tell her for what. So far, it had only shown interest in the blacksmithing carts. It had requested a staggering amount of various metals and ores stored there. 
The event had caused a small confrontation, with Ulagan having to prevent the other guardians from stopping him and the elders having to pause their meeting with Kalik. After a brief discussion, the elders, begrudgingly, agreed to offer the metal to the Lord Protector as thanks for bringing the survivors home. The village would have to eat the cost and pay the blacksmiths back for the losses. The Slate Walkers weren't the richest village, but they specialized in traps and arrays, so their stockpile of various metals was significant. That they were headed to the Earth Shrine, where they could trade with other villages and restock on necessities, meant that the village wouldn't suffer too badly, especially with the treasure gathered by the other groups during the examination trips. So how did all that culminate in the Lord Protector playing hunter and prey with a group of the village's children? It all started while the Lord Protector used the materials to heal. It looked more like the spirit beast was crafting armor to her. But she wasn't a crafter, so what did she know? Instead of eating the material like she'd expected, the various materials were mixed, refined, and transformed in ways she couldn't understand. Various broken and burned carapace pieces were removed and broken down, then reformed in mere minutes. The spectacle was so mesmerizing and magical that it soon gathered a small crowd, including many of the craftsmen the Lord Protector had requested the materials from. Several were even sketching the scene with a fervor that burned to Zolazar's gift. In only a short two hours, the Lord Protector's outer shell had gone from broken and melted in several places to a pristine metallic sheen. Where once the spirit beast appeared broken, it now radiated a regal, if dangerous, air. She could tell the repairs, wasn't perfect, though. Some areas were slightly off color, while others were thicker than their undamaged originals. Regardless, the Lord Protector looked in far better shape than he had only a few hours prior. As the show ended, the crowd slowly dispersed. Well, most of them did. A small group of half a dozen children lingered on the edge of where the crowd had stood, held back by a pair of guardians. They stared up at the Lord Protector with wide-eyed wonder, pointing and whispering to each other. Now, if one thing can be said about Slate Walker children, it was that no others under the sun had quite the talent for getting into things and places they shouldn't be. Solzaya had fond memories of all the trouble she, you two, and Ganna had gotten into during their youth, and they had been one of the meeker groups, but Slate Walker standards. So it should have been no surprise to anyone when a tiny girl suddenly stood up on top of the Lord Protector's back, declaring herself the world's best beast tamer. What followed was a chaotic mix of laughing children being chased by guardians, parents screaming or yelling, and general confusion as guardians pulled one child off the spirit beast, only to turn around and find two more fighting to be on top. So a typical afternoon in the Slate Walker village. The mess had gone a long way toward lifting the somewhat a mood that had blanketed the village since their group's return. It helped that the Lord Protector did not mind the children crawling over him. Things might have been different if Falagan and Ganna weren't laughing the entire time. Of course, with the two's assurance that the children would be fine, the other guardians let them be. More than a few people spoke out, questioning if it was wise to let the children play around an unknown obviously powerful spirit beast in this manner, regardless of how gentle it seemed around them. Solazaya would admit she felt the same, in a way. Her gift told her that while the Lord Protector didn't mind and genuinely enjoyed the children's company, there was more to it. This, too, was just another way for it to endear itself to them. Manipulation on top of manipulation. But the cheery, excited play of the children soon drowned out the voice of the naysayers. Soon. The play had evolved into a game of hunter and prey, partly on Nulagan's suggestion. The young guardian was quickly becoming one of the most vocal proponents of the Lord Protector in the village, alongside Ganna. She could tell they were hiding something from her, but she couldn't quite tell what, and that made her nervous. Part of her wondered if she should tell them her own secret and speak suspicions about the Lord Protector. Another calmer part of her warned it could cause more trouble. The Lord Protector was unpredictable. There was no telling how it might react if it knew she could tell there was more to him than he let on. Ultimately, she chose to watch and observe, then report her concerns to Kalik once the meetings with the elders were finished. As her mentor, she was one of the few who knew of her gift. Equals 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 equals. 
Alpha stood and gently pulled the pile of sleeping children off him. The AI was used rambunctious, energetic children, but Lord above, these were something else. The plan was originally to play nice with the kids and give off a more friendly neighborhood 15 meter tall robot vibe. It had worked before, especially on worlds where people didn't really have a concept of what a war machine looked like. People let their guard down around you more when they saw you playing with children. Even the guards they had watching him seemed less tense as they moved the small pile of bodies and brought them to waiting parents. Alpha had to admit, he'd expected more pushback than he'd received in this village so far. More often than not, first contact was met with fear, suspicion, and weariness. While that was still present, it was more like that of a stranger visiting town than a gargantuan metal creature of unknown origins. Even when he pushed and tested their limits by raiding their metal storage, he'd only gotten some pointed questions and was gifted the materials by what he assumed were village leaders. Not that he was complaining, the materials had been enough to cover much of his more pressing repair needs. He was still short on supplies, and the torp wasn't at 100%, but he no longer had to worry about pushing the frame too hard or breaking something important. It was strange. Even so, something told Alpha he was still missing context. Lucky for Alpha, he had a village to explore now. Well, less him and more his swarm of wasps. Since arriving, there, wasps, had spread out through the village, hiding in various places, gathering data, or scouting out points of interest. Things were going great, even if most of the information he gathered had been mundane village gossip. His lexicon had taken a tremendous leap over the last few hours, with thousands of new data points to pull from. He was fairly certain he could hold a lengthy conversation with a local now, but stuck to the mysterious silent type image he'd been cultivating so far. After all, people were far more willing to speak freely around you when they thought you couldn't understand them. He'd never quite seen a town like this, though. Roaming cities weren't anything new to Alpha. A notable portion of the Federation population chose to live in giant city ships instead of on a planet. But this was the first he'd seen that was so low-tech. On each of the nearly 600 carts that made up the village, a building was built. These varied from small, single-family homes to large workshops filled with complex tools. What Alpha could only assume was the town hall was the largest, and it looked like it could easily house over 300 people at once. At over 3,000 people, by Alpha's count, the village's population was respectable for such a setup, if not enormous. They even appeared to be in the middle of expansion if the two dozen unfinished carts being pulled behind the others said anything. At the end day, though, a cart was a cart, even if the drive, suspension and axle systems were far more advanced than Alpha expected. Instead of being automated, each cart was pulled by a large, elk-like creature, a grand elk, as the villagers called them. They were gargantuan beasts, easily half the size of the torp. Not quite megafauna, but pushing the limits. They seemed powerful, too, with a team of two easily pulling a smaller building cart with little difficulty, while teams of six to ten pulled the larger carts. These grand elk even seemed to pull double duty as both herd animals and cart engines, as he'd witnessed several families milking or shearing their large companions. The creatures themselves were strangely docile, almost cow-like in their disposition though that may have simply resulted from generations of domestication. The combination of more than a thousand large herbivores and hundreds of heavy carts resulted in a long, neatly flattened scar through the prairies trailing the village for miles. Alpha was sure that if he looked at it from the sky, he could track the village's progression up to this point going back possibly months. One particular cart had caught Alpha's attention almost immediately after spotting it with a wasp. It was a small, inconspicuous cottage nestled in what Alpha assumed to be a residential section of the village. Given how many homes were in the area, at first glance, there wasn't anything very special about it. In fact, it seemed in need of a new paint job, even if it appeared well lived in. No, what caught Alpha's attention was how it practically glowed, not to the visible eye but with the same strange energy waves he'd recorded during his first encounter with Yutu and Gambata, where the young man had created a spatial distortion from out of nowhere. Intrigued, Alpha piloted the 
wasp, and approached the building. The tiny drone landed on the roof and quietly approached the strange lines, giving off the energy signal. It was gentle, almost undetectable compared to the violent storm the spatial distortion had given off, but undeniably similar. Alpha couldn't even tell how they worked. They appeared like nothing more than lines carved into the wood grain to him. Lines so fine and simple that if you didn't know they were there, you'd be mistaken for thinking they were just random scratches. Yet, somehow, they, what do we have here? Suddenly, there, wasp, was plucked from the surface by its wings. The small drone struggled, but couldn't escape the assailant's grasp. Soon, Alpha was looking through the, wasp's, camera into the smiling face of a wrinkled, hunched over old man. The man peered at the drone with one open eye and spoke, and who might you be, my little friend? The drone went still. Unsure if the senile old man talking to a bug was serious or not. Wait. Weren't they on the roof? 18. Book 1. Lesson 33. Be sure to get it in writing. Alpha, or rather there. Wasp, sat across the table from a wrinkly old man, a cup of tea in front of each. The old man sipped his tea and sighed. Then yelled louder than necessary in such a small building. How much longer, woman? I'm hungry. A more feminine if no less wizened, yelled back from around the corner. The voice not losing in volume. Oh, be quiet. You old coot, have some patience. You're lucky we have a guest, or you'll eat at all rods all week. The old man's eyes widened, and he sat a little straighter. Yes, dear. An old woman walked around the corner, carrying a tray full of steaming plates. She was just as hunched and wrinkled as the old man. But Alpha had seen enough old humans to know she moved with an eerie grace and strength that belied her apparent advanced age. The meal she laid out for her and her husband was simple, some porridge, rice, steamed vegetables, and a cup of tea. Despite that, the old man dug into the meal with gusto. The old woman smiled at Alpha and placed a small sauce dish before him. Her smile was gentle and sweet like an old grandma looking at her favorite grandchild. I'm sorry about the limited spread, dearie, I wasn't expecting company. Alpha stared down into the small sauce dish, unsure of what he saw. Instead of the porridge the couple enjoyed, a pitch black liquid filled the dish. It swirled around, seemingly of its own accord, as tiny glowing sparks of something appeared and disappeared. Alpha turned there, wasp to look up at the old woman, only to see her beaming down at him. She flicked her hand and spoke. Go on, go on. Tell me what you think. It's not often I get to cook for your kind. Not anymore, at least. Alpha shrugged and moved there. Wasp, toward the dish. He couldn't actually eat, but, wasps, had storage takes built into their design to deliver injections and take samples as necessary. He wasn't sure what kind of food this was. But Alpha's instincts told him it would be worth analyzing. The old woman's grin grew wider as there. Wasp, slowly emptied the small dish. Alpha spoke through the drone, using directed sound waves generated by its wings. Thank you for the meal. Technically, that wasn't part of their design, but a certain AI nearly a century ago had developed the technique to silently pass on instructions in a sensitive environment. Alpha had liked the idea so much he'd spent a week mastering it. Only an AI could accurately replicate it, but it was useful in many ways. The old man, who had been happily munching away at his meal, spewed a mouthful of rice to the side, coughing as he pounded his chest. The old woman's brow rose, but her smile never dropped. Oh. You're welcome, dearie. You can call me Mullet, by the way, and this. She smacked the back of the old man beside her. Old fool is my husband, Malarkey. Who might you be? Alpha paused before speaking. The people of the village have been referring to me as the Lord Protector. The old woman who called herself Millet threw back her head and laughed. Now, I asked for your name, little one, not what the children call you. Alpha considered for a moment. Interesting. He corrected himself. You can call me Alpha. Millet smiled down at their wasp brightly. Very nice to meet you, young Alpha. Welcome to our humble home. She lifted the small cup beside her plate and took a drink, a motion mimicked by her still coughing husband. The two then dug back into their food. The next few moments were filled with near constant banter between the pair, and though the words might have seemed scalding on the surface, 
their tone told that there was no true venom behind them. Alpha took it all in calmly, at first, he wasn't sure why he played along with the old man, he could have easily broken down their, wasp, into its constituent nanites and recalled them, but the strange energy lines carved into the house had fascinated him, it tickled some base part of his programming he couldn't pinpoint in a way few things had. A quick survey of the village showed that most buildings had similar lines engraved on them, especially on their axle systems, yet no building, even the important looking ones, glowed, quite as bright as this humble little shack on wheels, in fact, now that he paid attention, Alpha could detect similar lines running throughout the house, some of them were clumped together on or around various objects, others ran in long, branching pathways that connected the various clumps together or twisted into patchworks that reminded Alpha of the veins in an animal, or the circuits on a board. Even if most of them looked more like artwork than anything meaningful, even the dinnerware the cup let from glowed with faint lines. If you had the eyes to see, curious, Alpha moved there, wasp, to get a better look at the small sauce dish. Unsurprisingly, he found the inside etched with a complex swirling design. Alpha stared at the design, pondering. Strange, as an AI, Alpha could observe the world far more accurately than most biologicals. His kind wasn't particularly susceptible to optical illusions, at least not the same kind. So why was it that the more he stared at the design, the more he felt a distinct sense of motion? For lack of a better term, it was almost as if the longer he looked, the more the design seemed to swirl. Interested, are you? That, dollar hash at dollar percent, is one of my favorites. So versatile if you know how to use it correctly. Mullet grinned from ear to ear as she spoke. Malaki, her husband, put down his bowl and spoke for the first time since the meal had started. Bah, it's nothing more than a parlor trick. It can't do half the things a proper, percent hash dollar hash, could. Mullet's size narrowed, and she frowned. She turned and spoke to the old man, her voice flat. You have just never appreciated the simple things. It's all flash and show for you. Malaki turned to his wife, pointing his spoon at her as he spoke. Exactly. Why put in so much work if you can't show it off? If you had your way, no one would even know you put it there in the first place. Mullet sighed, placing her face in her free hand. Her voice sounded tired when she spoke. Like this wasn't the first time they'd had this discussion. And it likely wouldn't be the last. That's the point of a trap, you see Nile Codger. Why do you think I had to clean up your mess during there? The next twenty minutes were filled with a lengthy argument, debate, peppered with enough unknown words that Alpha's lexicon nearly doubled in size. Great, more work. It went on for so long that Alpha seriously contemplated just taking the dish and making a break for it. After some time, the couple remembered they had a guest and turned back to Alpha. Mullet switched back to kindly old grandma mode and apologized. Sorry about that, dearie. He gets like that sometimes. TSK. You're one to talk. Yow. The pouting malarkey mumbled under his breath, only to jump at some unseen assault. Millet never stopped smiling or staring down at Alpha as she spoke. Are you curious? We don't take students. Typically, at least not without an extensive understanding of who we're dealing with. But we're always up for a trade. How about it? Alpha considered for a moment and asked, A trade? What kind of trade? The old woman leaned back in her chair, her hands folded. Gone was the kindly old grandma, and in her place was a presence Alpha knew all too well. Why? Information. Of course, you seem quite interested in our arrays. Again, there was that word. Alpha wasn't sure what a proper translation would be, but he at least understood she meant the lines he was observing. Millet continued. While I'm quite curious about that, she pointed to some undesirable place above the wasp. Alpha turned the drone to see what she was pointing at. But seeing nothing, he asked, and what is that you speak of? Malaki turned around, frowning, and spoke. She's talking about this. Boy. The old man leaned over and plucked the air above the drone. Instantly, Alpha's connection to the wasp wobbled in a way that if he had been physically capable, Alpha might have thrown up. The moment he regained control of the drone, there, wasp shot backward, off the table to land on the far wall. What the hell had that just been? Back at the table, 
Millet was smacking the old man with her spoon. See, I keep telling you that you can't be so rough. She then turned back to Alpha, the kindly old grandma returning. I'm sorry about that, dearie. Come, come, he won't do it again. I'm sorry, my husband has a bad habit of touching things he really shouldn't. The last was said as she turned and gave the old man beside her a hard look. Malaki only humped and turned away. Mullet turned back around and continued. Now, as I was saying, I'm quite curious about what you're doing, young Alpha. I've never quite seen such a complex puppet be controlled without a speck of percent percent at hash percent hash. I'm not even sure I have the right word for whatever that is. Alpha's guard instantly shot up several degrees. Not only could they detect and even disrupt his connection to the drone, but they could also tell it was something being controlled rather than his actual body. That was worrying. Alpha wasn't delusional enough to think this was just some random, kindly old couple at this point. But from what Alpha had observed so far, he'd assumed the locals were more primitive. Was this just more magical bullcrap? Or was there something he wasn't seeing? Alpha wasn't sure explaining how he controlled his drone was such a good idea. This was just a basic signal, and he could always change it. But once that information was out there, who knew when it might come back to bite him in the butt? He answered with as much as well. I'm not sure that's in my best interest, Mrs. Millet. Millet raised her hands and shook her head. No, please. Millet is fine, and maybe I miscommunicated. I'm not asking for your secrets or how you are doing it. Only what it is. I've seen nothing like this, and it had me curious. What do you say? You explain what it is, and we'll give you a short primer in a raise, quid pro quo. Everyone wins. Alpha considered the offer more. On the one hand, it was a risk. He wasn't in a position to flaunt much of what he could do openly right now. Experience told him that the longer he could play the mysterious being card, the more he could manipulate things to his advantage. His options would shrink once that mystery and intrigue began to peel away. Natives of New Worlds were, technically and legally, Federation civilians from the moment Alpha touched the surface. Whether or not they knew it yet, he couldn't go around burning down cities for their resources, without a good reason, for example. Now if the guard or any other military force, decided they stand against him, he could use his military rank to suppress them as rebels, but that was an entirely different matter, if some random civilian acted against him, though, there was little he could do until they physically attacked him, that's why people skills, and you, diplomacy, was needed when dealing with SIFs, if that diplomacy involved the natives believing Alpha was a monstrous being of unknown power capable of destroying them and everything they loved if they didn't do as he said? Well, Alpha wasn't responsible for their own misunderstanding. So, the question would be, was the risk of explaining some minor details about his technology worth saving vast amounts of time trying to research something he might not even have the proper context for? Mullet stared down at the wasp her brow furrowing. The drone hadn't moved for some time as Alpha contemplated his best action. She smacked her husband and whispered, look what you did, you broke it. The old man looked at her, a hand on his chest. I did no such thing, woman. You, fine. But under some conditions, Alpha spoke at last, causing both old humans to turn their eyes on him. Malaki narrowed his eyes and asked, what conditions? I was never here. We never spoke and anything you learn, you figured out yourself. Both humans leaned back in their chairs and shared a long look. It was Millet who broke the silence. That's fine. Though we'll ask the same in return. You're not the only one who enjoys their privacy. Alpha nodded. Deal. The next two hours were a back and forth discussion about the nature of light and how different wavelengths and frequencies have unique properties. When the talk was over, Malaki looked severally disappointed while Millet was working on filling her third small notebook. Malaki frowned and crossed his arms. You expect me to believe you're controlling a puppet like that, using nothing more than what amounts to a signal fire? Bullcrap. Millet smacked him across the chest with a notebook. Fool, were you not paying attention at all? It's the same principle as, dollar and dollar at, only there, and dollar and at, and there, dollar at hash percent, are physical. Instead, dollar, at hash, 
Malaki threw his arms into the air. Sure. Then how do you explain their dollar hash at percent principle? Or how dollar hash at works? How does it even work when there's no percent dollar hash? This thing signal is cutting through 20 layers of jamming arrays. Mullet squealed and clutched her notebook to her chest, her eyes shining. I know, right? I haven't had a puzzle like this since the time we got lost in there. Dollar hash percent at. She turned back to her notebook, writing notes with the speed and dexterity of a woman half her age. She waved the old man away, not even bothering to look up. Now, shoo, shoo, I've got experiments to plan. You can give the young Alpha his lessons instead of me. Malaki's eyes bulged, and he yelled, Wait, why me? You know I hate teaching the brats. Do it yourself. But Millet only gave the old man a flat look before returning to her work. Malaki grumbled, frowning. His frown suddenly turned into a grin, though, as he looked at Alpha and shrugged. Sorry, kid. I've got things that need doing. I mean, it's not like we got the agreement in writing. Better luck next time. Take this as a learning experience. That will be my real lesson to you. Aren't I the kindest? The old man looked down at Alpha with a grin, smiling smugly. Alpha only stared back in silence. A flash of light appeared from the drone, and a miniature copy of the old man sat at the miniature table, parroting back word for word the terms of their agreement. Malaki stared down at the tiny copy of himself, his eyes wide and mouth agape, while Malid pointed and laughed at him until she turned blue from breathlessness. Malaki's smile turned rigged, and a vein pulsed on the side of his head. He looked down at Alpha and spoke, Fine, fine. I'll do it. Both of you are bastards, by the way. The smile spread from ear to ear, though instead of being friendly, Alpha was sure it could have scared away a rabid dog. When the man spoke, his voice was eerily cheery. You don't seem the type to enjoy a classroom lecture, though. So let's do this a little different. Before even Alpha's enhanced reflexes could react, the man reached across the table and plucked his connection to the drone again. Instead of simply wobbling, However, this time, the connection snapped, and the drone's connection broke entirely. 19. Book 1. Lesson 34. Be careful who you mess with. John was a simple man with a simple job. Run through the village, deliver the mail, and collect his pay. Well, simple was a bit deceptive when your town covered nearly 300 square kilometers and constantly rearranged itself. Still, it was honest work and, more importantly, to John, safe. Not like those trappers and gatherers who regularly ventured out into the wilds of the prairies. Or even worse, his psychotic seniors, the town runners, who delivered their packages between the various cities and villages that made up the wandering cities. Really, he never understood what kind of person thought it was a good idea to wander through the radiant sea without a grass redder. Who knew what kind of strange beasts or cultivators you might run into out there? No. John was perfectly happy delivering mail within the confines of the Slate Walker village. It's not like much of anything ever happened here. Today had been a good day. He only had a few more parcels to deliver today, too. He even heard there would be a feast later, though he hadn't gotten the details of why. No matter. His second to last parcel was a letter to the captain of the Guardians directly from the Elders, a last minute addition to his route. It always made John feel important when he got to deliver such vital mail. Even if the captain was an intimidating man, he hummed to himself as he rounded the corner, following the tracking jade the Capitan carried on his person. Only almost be run over by a huge black blur that rushed past. John froze mid-step, his heart racing, his head turned on rusty hinges to stare at the retreating figure, a giant black spirit beast the likes of which he'd never seen, races around the open field at blistering speeds, a dozen children screaming wildly on its back, four guardians in full armor chased after it, their silver auras blazing, what was happening, were they under attack, were the children being kidnapped, what should he do, did he need to find someone, did he need to run, help, he, eelp, John turned back the way he came, his eyes rolling and heart pounding in his chest when a large hand fell on his shoulder. John turned to see the captain staring down at him. The older man smiled and spoke in his deep, booming voice. R. John, 
It's good to see you. I assume that means the elders have sent updated instructions. Good to know. John turned, his arms flailing as he tried to speak. Captain, the thing, Capitan. Big. Children. Black. That way. What do you or th The captain of the Guardian stared down at the runner with a frown. His head tilted. He then turned in the direction John was pointing, his eyes widening. The Capitan turned with a smile and patted the much smaller man's shoulder with a laugh. Ah, I see. It must have been a busy day if you have not heard about our new guest. Don't worry. We have everything under control. As if in response to his words, a loud explosion sounded in the distance, accompanied by a small dust cloud and light tremor. John could only stare in silence. When he turned back around, the captain was smiling down at him, his hand outstretched. John numbly reached into his near-empty satchel and retrieved the letter before passing it over and saluting. The captain nodded and turned away, dismissing the quiet runner. Without another word, John turned and ran in the opposite direction, desperate to put as much distance as possible between himself and the captain's giant guest. When he at last stopped, John leaned against his knee sucking in lunges full of air. Well, that was enough excitement for the month. He did not know what was happening back there, and he did not want to find out. All he wanted to do was finish his last delivery for the day, then go home. He needed a nap. Thankfully, his last stop was one he always enjoyed. All he had to do was deliver the package to the nice elderly couple who lived near the edge of town. It was close by to what luck. This was his favorite stop if he was honest. Old Malarkey could be grumpy sometimes, but his wife, Millet, was a sweet old broad who always offered him a cup of some of the best tea he'd ever had. Every time he drank it, he felt revitalized and energized, like he hadn't just spent ten hours running all over town. Grinning ear to ear, he turned the corner and froze. John stared wide-eyed, mouth agape, what should have been a small, Homely cottage was now covered in what appeared to be hundreds of finger-sized wasps. They surrounded the building, some flying around in circles, others clinging to every surface. Many continually bounced off the windows and other openings, producing small flashes of light as they collided with some kind of barrier. John took a step back, unsure of what he should do. There was no way he was approaching the house like that. Yet, simultaneously, it wasn't like he could abandon the nice old couple to, to whatever this was. Should he turn around and inform the captain? But then what if he encountered his guest again? What should he do? However, his choice was soon taken from him as the door to the cottage flew open, and an old woman appeared. However, she didn't look like the kindly old grandma John was used to. No, this millet was disheveled, with messy hair and bloodshot eyes. Her face and hands stained almost black with various ink stains. So unlike the neat and tidy woman he expected. The instant the door opened, a large group of the wasps broke away and charged the open door, only to be repelled but the same strange barrier. Her eyes scanned the surroundings before locking on to him. An icy chill ran down his spine, and the ear-to-ear -ear smile she gave him looked like it belonged more to a tiger than an old woman. She called out to him, waving him forward. Ah, John, about time. I trust you brought what I ordered? Come, come, hurry now. John's eyes scanned the buzzing swarm. Grandma Millet laughed and called out. Don't worry, boy, they won't hurt you. It's just two children having a bit of a spat, that's all. John shook his head and took a step back. He did not know what that meant, but there was no way he was getting any closer. Mullet sighed and flicked her finger toward him. Instantly, something latched onto the front of his uniform and forcibly dragged him closer. Before he could react, John was standing before Mullet in the middle of a buzzing swarm. The old woman crossed her arms and stared at him, her foot tapping and a brow raised. Visibly shaking, John reached into his satchel and pulled out the package, a head-sized jar of ink and a dozen new booklets. Mullet snatched them from his grasp faster than he could see and held them to her chest with the fervor of a starving man grabbing a loaf of bread. Yes, thank you, John, who knows what I'd have done if you hadn't shown up. Her words were simple, but the way she had spoken them. His shivering redoubled. The old woman smiled up at the young man with something more akin to what he was used to, then tossed him a coin, a tip for your trouble. 
Have a good day, John. With those words, she slammed the door in his face. John looked down at the coin in his hand to find an entire crystal chip, more than he'd made in a month if he was lucky. Still shivering, John looked up to find much of the wasp swarm sitting near the doorway, just staring at him, his shaking knuckles going white around the small coin in his hand. John could feel tears welling up in his eyes. He just wanted this day to be over already. Alpha watched as the apparent mailman rushed back to the cover of the nearby house carts. The small wasp clinging to the back of the man's collar switched out for a fresh one, with the young man none the wiser. Alpha had been tracking the mailman all day, and it had done wonders for putting names to places and people, as well as being a gold mine of other information. As they, Alpha, said, if you want to really know someone, go through their mail. Of course, most of it had been rather useless to him. Much of it he couldn't even read, the written portion of his lexicon was coming along far slower than the spoken portion. But he had come across some rather scandalous tidbits that he absolutely, positively would use to blackmail someone sometime down the line. Hey, if you didn't want to be blackmailed, don't use public postal services. The other part of his day had been attempting glorious revenge. That old codger thought he could trick Alpha? He was the one who was supposed to be screwing with people who did this bastard think he was. For a moment, he'd contemplated showing up in person, then blowing a hole through their front door. A calmer part of him decided that would be a poor choice. He was sure his escorts wouldn't appreciate him shooting up the nice old couple down the lane's house. That would erase all the goodwill he'd built so far. Instead, he'd sent a few more wasps to the house only to be blocked by an energy barrier that definitely wasn't there before when he tried to sneak back in. The old man, seeming to sense Alpha's attempt, peered out at the drones, grinned from ear to ear, and waved at him. Alpha had tried to will the drone through the glass, to no avail. Malarkey actually stuck his tongue out at Alpha before returning to whatever it was he was doing to the deactivated wasp on the table, his back turned so Alpha couldn't get a good look. Oh? He wanted war. Then, Alpha would show him war. He was built for it, literally. It wasn't even about their wasp. He could make thousands of them. No, this was personal now. Soon, the house was surrounded by hundreds of tiny drones equipped with various tools and equipment, each trying to break through the barrier differently, but to no luck. It had been nearly eight hours now, and nothing he tried worked. Not even the plasma wielder rated to repair fighter class Sharma put more than a few scorch marks on the old, glowing wood. Alpha doubted he would see any progress unless he could figure out how these barriers worked. Just as he contemplated if he really needed to show up in the top, the barrier surrounding the house fizzled like static and popped. The connection to the wayward drone was re-established, and Alpha took control immediately. The drone's camera came online and the first image Alpha saw at the grinning face of the old man, so he did the only reasonable thing at the moment, he charged Malarkey, Stinger first, the old man leaned out of the way, easily dodging the telegraph strike, and the next one from his blind spot too, and the next, and so on. The dance continued for several moments before an empty inkwell swapped the wasp from the sky, rebounding to strike the old codger between the eyes. While Alva stabilized the drone and Malarkey nursed his new world, Millet yelled from across the room, Will you two cut that out? You're distracting me. Alpha landed on the nearby table, and Malarkey sat down, rubbing his head. Alpha was the first to speak. Cough up, old man. We had an agreement. Don't think I'm afraid to play that recording around town. You think you're shameless? I've been doing this since your great-grandfather was in diapers. The old man folded his heart and leaned back, laughing. I'm sure that's incorrect, regardless of how old you think you are. Nonetheless, young man, I don't know what you're talking about. I've already upheld my end of the bargain. Alpha pointed to Malarkey with a drone leg. Bullcrap. All you've. The old man pulled a small mirror from nowhere and placed it in front of Alpha. The AI paused mid-sentence and turned the drone around to get a better look from various angles where once it was just a plain drone. There, wasp, was now covered in intricate, crossing lines from leg to wing tip. Some were thick and glowed with a strange light, while others were so thin they might have been microscopic to the human eye. 
Yet, every single one was made with a level of mind-boggling detail, to the point Alpha wondered if the man didn't somehow have a secret workshop filled with advanced machinery somewhere in the house. That might have sounded ridiculous, given the technological level he'd observed so far and the size of the house in general, but it was no less ridiculous than thinking the geriatric man had made the lines by hand. All the lines eventually converged to a single spot. A tiny, glowing gem in the center of their, wasp's, head. The old man in question looked down at Alpha and raised an eyebrow. Well? Alpha was silent for a moment before responding. Well, what? I asked for lessons, old man, not for you to bling my drone. The old man grinned, then flicked something towards the drone. It flew toward the drone with astounding speed, but rebounded off a small energy shield before it struck. An energy shield the drone hadn't been equipped with only a few hours earlier. Alpha looked up to see what appeared to be a chopstick embedded several inches in the ceiling, still quivering from the force of the impact. Malaki grinned from ear to ear and laughed. Everything you need to know about arrays is stuffed into that. That is, if you have the eyes to see it. Ha ha ha. And if you don't, the old man shrugged and leaned back in his chair. Well then, you were never worth teaching. That's not my problem. Malaki folded his hands and smiled like he'd told the best joke in the world. Do be careful not to go showing that off, though. Some more. Unsavory types would chase you to the ends of the world for what's there. Alpha silently observed the various lines on the drone with interest. There definitely was some pattern there some kind of rule to how they moved and flowed. There was also a defined progression, where the lines became progressively more complex. The question was, was it enough? After a long moment, Alpha finally responded. Fine, I'll take it. The old man leaned forward, all smiles. Good, now get. I've already wasted enough time on this. Maybe if you bring me something actually interesting, there will be more to say. Alpha flew up and hovered in the air. That's fair, then I'll be on my way, though, before I do, one last gift. The old man crossed his arms and raised his brow with an arrogant smirk. Oh? At that moment, the cloaking hiding the, wasp, on the man's shoulder dropped. Malaki's eyes went wild, and he moved to grab it, but it was too late. The drone stinger pierced the side of the man's neck and injected its payload a split second before it was crushed. The man wiped the drone remains from his shoulder and narrowed his eyes at Alpha. And what did you expect that to do, little boy? I'll have you know I'm immune to more poisons than you know exist. Alpha laughed. Who said it was a poison? The old man raised an eyebrow, then suddenly clutched his lower abdomen. The man's eyes bulged as his gut started making loud rumbling noises. He turned to his wife, sweating. Millard. Millard, help. The old woman didn't even look up from her notebooks as she responded. If you clog the piping, I'm not fixing it. And remember to refill the water tank. The old man's face dropped, and he rushed from the room, deeper into the house. The house was soon filled with the sound of Alpha's laughter and more. Unpleasant noises. 19. Book 1. Lesson 35. Remember to read the instruction manual. Alpha poked the drone with a manipulator probe as it rested in the torp's maintenance bay. Bays like this were intended to service larger, more expensive drones, but he didn't have many other options. There, wasps, were cheap and disposable. After all, the drone twitched, and a small light pulse flowed down the lines carved directly into its chassis. That itself was an anomaly. Wasp, drones were made nearly entirely of nanites barring a light metallic skeleton. Any damage to the drone could be repaired near instantly. The drone would break down into its composite nanites only after the internal framework was destroyed beyond repair. So how had the old codger done it? Regardless of how often he ran extensive diagnostic reports, they all came back as nothing wrong. It was as if nanites couldn't recognize the changes to the drone. As if the lines had always been a part of it. The nanites couldn't tell the difference even when the drone was compared to standard wasps. How? Huh? Why? The entire thing was grinding on his sanity. At least from a programming standpoint. The software was giving him all kinds of issues, but the hardware was coming along far better. He'd yet to identify the energy stored in the strange gem embedded in the drone's head. But how the energy circulated was easy enough to observe. 
In fact, the unknown energy was observable in several spectrums, and even seemed to change depending on where it was being directed. It flowed through the grooves as easily as water through pipes or electricity through circuits. Alpha suspected that was exactly what they were, but more testing would have to be done. The Third Federation's own hardware and software had long evolved past simple yes, no binary code, but would any of that transfer over? The secret would likely lie in the unknown energy source, which only brought him back to the question of what exactly was it. More importantly, was he willing to risk experimenting with an entirely new, potentially dangerous energy source without the slightest idea what he was doing? Dot of course he was. The first thing he tried to do was to isolate the energy from the system. This proved more difficult than Alpha had originally suspected. While in the gem, the energy was totally non-reactive. Even the soft glow the gem gave off was nothing more than common light to Alpha's equipment. The gem seemed designed to be replaceable and could easily be removed and reattached to the drone with some small manipulation of its component nanites. It was even carved with a little spiraling groove that slotted seamlessly into the design. But once it was removed, all energy flow stopped completely, and Alpha was left with what appeared to be just a pretty rock. Observing the energy as it exited the stone was pointless, as any break in the connecting seal would render the entire thing inert. Trying to siphon off the energy as it flowed through the grooves was just as frustrating. Carving any new grooves into the system caused that section of grooves to shut down. The energy would just stop flowing through that area, bypassing it entirely through several node points. Alpha made some headway thanks to that, however. By selectively cutting off different sections, he could map several key sections of the groove network. The various sections' purpose was anyone's guess but it was progress. Studying the gem itself yielded some interesting results as well. Close examination and some micro samples revealed the gem to be, in reality, some form of organic crystal. One of his sub a.i.s dinged an entry in his logs, and Alpha pulled up the record. The crystal was a nearly identical match in structure and composition to the strange crystals he had pulled out of a few penguins' hearts. Interesting. Alpha pulled one of the sample crystals he'd collected from the Torp's storage and compared the two. Other than the drone's gem being meticulously cut and polished, the two gems were identical in size, roughly half the drone's head, and similar in color, though far richer and deeper. Though from what little Alpha knew of lapidary, the stone that the cut gem came from had likely been several times larger. The theory was further supported by a large number of cracks and inclusions in the raw crystal. But the real question was, did it contain the same type of energy itself, or was it merely a container? It was hard to tell, as the raw crystal was as inert as the cut stone when disconnected from the groove network. With that in mind, there was a simple way of testing it, and it just so happened to be a specialty of Alpha's, copying other people's work and pretending like it was his own. Hatsa, it works. Mullet raised her ink-stained hands into the air and cheered. Malaki lowered the book he'd been reading and peered over its edge toward his wife. Back in the land of the living, I see. Good. What's for din? The small red welt on his forehead doubled in size as the sound of another empty inkwell contacting his skull cut off his words. Malaki rubbed his head and glared at the ink-stained woman on the other side of the room. Grumbling, he asked. Fine, fine. What did you do? Mullet grinned from ear to ear and raised a single finger. A small light bloomed at its tip. Malaki waved his hand, unimpressed. Nothing special. Any Yunjin with a bit of talent could do that. Millet's grin widened even further. The light on top of her finger blinked out. No. That wasn't quite right. Malaki narrowed his eyes and focused on the point above her finger. He could see the air. Waver slightly. The old man switched to, spirit sight, but he couldn't quite make out what he was seeing even then. It looked like she was just channeling spirit energy into nothing? No, not nothing, again, her spirit energy flexed, and now the nothing became a different nothing? That didn't make any sense. The old man stood, walked over, and waved his hand over his wife's finger. It was hot, an invisible flame? No, there was no fire affinity at all, it simply was heat, he'd heard of a heatless flame before. 
but flameless heat? How? Oh, sure. The uneducated might say that sunlight was a kind of flameless heat, but those in the know understood that even the heat of the sister above and the faraway sun were just different aspects and manifestations of fire. That was why any aspiring solar major or cultivator had to start with learning the basics of fire before moving on to controlling the more complicated solar affinity. Even the boiling lakes far to the icy north could be attributed to the burning magma found deep below. So how was she producing heat without the smallest amount of fire-aligned spirit energy? He asked her as much, too. How are you doing that? Mullet only smirked. You weren't paying the slightest bit of attention, were you? Malarkey only grumped and turned away, muttering something under his breath about rude juniors and nerdy old women, then yelped as a small scorch mark appeared on the back of his head. Malarkey smacked the spot, then whirled around to face the old crone. Mullet didn't even bother pretending she wasn't responsible. Malarkey's face flushed red, and he opened his mouth to yell, but another scorch mark appeared right over the still swollen lump on his head. Mullet broke into laughter as he rubbed the now lightly singed lump. She flexed her spirit energy a third time, but Malarkey was ready for it this time. He threw up a small spirit barrier in front of the invisible attack, only for a third scorch mark to appear on his chest. The old man went pale as Mullet's grin turned predatory. Of course, a barrier meant to block a spirit attack hadn't worked. There was never any spirit energy, to begin with. The patrolling guardian, who would later respond to claims of someone skinning a cat, would later refuse to give a full report on the grounds of concerns for his safety and well-being. Hatsa, it works. Alpha raised his arms in victory. He'd destroyed two dozen of the heart crystals trying to mimic the cut of the drone's gem, with little success. The raw crystals were surprisingly difficult to damage, but once he had, it had the nasty habit of grumbling to dust. It took a few tries before a careful examination of the cut stone showed it had never been truly cut at all. Instead, it appeared to have been fractured along some naturally occurring lines. Closer observation of the raw crystals revealed similar lines running throughout the crystal structure. Fracturing along these lines not only kept the crystal intact but somehow deepened the crystal's color. The pieces broken off, meanwhile, were pale and colorless, as if all the color had been drained from them. How that worked, Alpha didn't have the faintest clue. The next part had been the hardest, actually extracting the energy. Trying to carve the same spiral pattern into the gem no longer resulted in the crystal simply grumbling to dust. No, now the results were far more explosive, that such a small crystal, only a few millimeters wide after fracturing, could explode with such force was impressive. Thankfully, the torp was equipped with more than one bay. It took Alpha a few hours to come up with a solution. At first, he thought the spiral was there to transfer power, but why make it a spiral? Why cause so much damage to an already unstable crystal when other methods might work better? But what if the spiral was just there to increase the surface area in contact with the grooves instead? It wasn't there to draw out power but collect as much of the energy already leaking as possible. With that theory in mind, Alpha tried something different. Instead of cutting into the gem, Alpha carved the groove to fit the gem perfectly on a microscopic level. The form-fitted gem was connected to an exact replica of a section of the line network Alpha's experiments suggested acted as a reservoir for the energy before it was sent to other areas. Of course, scaled down to fit the much smaller gem, this section seemed to be responsible for actually pulling the energy out of the gem, though how it did so would have to be studied further. And it worked, kind of. The energy in the gem reacted as expected, flowing through the gem and into the reservoir. However, it did so chaotically, leaping from the grooves at random intervals and sputtering at times. Still, it was progress, or it was until the entire array network started to warp and twist. Oh, no, that can't be good. Using the drone launch platform in the bay, Alpha ejected the small piece of carved metal and embedded gem, no bigger than a few centimeters, into the air several dozen meters. The near meter wide fireball that lit up the night sky sent several nearby people running and set the guards on edge. It seemed Alpha still had some kinks to work out. 18. Book 1. Lesson 36. 
Multitasking can be fun too. Boom, 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 boom. Three of the fleeing targets erupted into large fireballs, spraying their remains over grassy prairies. The fourth and final target was a different beast altogether, however. It had dodged every attack thrown at it for the past ten minutes, but each new attack was closer than the last. Still, it bobbed and weaved through the air to buy more time. So much was riding on this, if only it could hold out but a little longer. Boom! It dodged another blast by a hair, only for the shock wave to send it spinning. Boom! It recovered just in time to dodge a second attack shortly after. The enemy was becoming quicker, if it didn't. Boom! Boom! Boom. Several consecutive blasts blocked its escape path and forced it to change directions. It only took a split second to realize it had been tricked, but even that wasn't enough time to save it. Equals 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 equals. A fourth blast hit the final stone target dead on, shattering it into a rain of shards and dust. The captain fell to his knees, tears in his eyes. His vacation funds. The surrounding crowd, on the other hand, cheered as various bets passed hands. The captain turned and glared at one group in particular. A large metal beast waved its arms in victory as a group of young children danced around him, several proudly wearing the patrol helmets they'd won off of his guardians. Damn these slate walker kids. They only got worse and worse with every generation. He sure as hell hadn't been this bad. Okay. So he had accidentally burned down a third of the village when he mistook an umbadraquelp for ash salamander, but that had been an accident. This was calculated maliciousness. The captain had only stepped away after receiving his new orders from the village council, mostly to finish the paperwork that would be needed later. A few hours later, he had gotten reports of explosions on the village parameter. He'd rushed to the scene, only to see the spirit beast, along with his ever growing gang of children had challenged his guards to a game of skeet. Guards who should have been watching their guest. No one knew the origin of skeet, but it had become a popular training exercise for guardians throughout the Radiant Sea. One or more soldiers would control a group of stone discs, while another group would attempt to shoot them out of the air with various spirit techniques. It was a great exercise for polishing control and accuracy as well as encouraging teamwork and quick thinking. Many would even place bets on the outcome of matches, even if it was technically against regulation. The captain himself was an expert evader, and he was proud to say he'd never once lost a match since entering the Golden Spirit step, even against his more powerful and well-trained seniors among the Jade Walkers. So when he'd seen the defeated looks on his men's faces, the captain couldn't let that stand. Of course, almost 30 minutes later, however, the results spoke for themselves. Even some of his own men had bet against him. The traitors, as the captain knelt in the grass, a figure approached. The captain looked up to see a young girl smiling gently down at him. She wasn't quite old enough to have started her own apprenticeship yet, but she was still one of the three oldest of the group, making her one of their leaders by default. The young girl's smile widened as he met her eyes and she held out a hand to him. The clouds of the captain's defeat seemed to part as his heart warmed at the girl's gesture. He smiled back at her and stretched his hand out to meet hers. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe there really was some hope for this generation of children, after all. As he did, the girl's hand passed by his and latched onto his helmet. Then, with one swift motion, she yanked it from his head. The captain could only stare, frozen, hand outstretched. As the girl ran away, raising her prize high about her head to the cheers of all the children. The captain's face sank, and he ground his teeth in frustration. Seeming to feel his stare, the captain's daughter turned round and stuck her tongue out at him before turning back to her friends. That was it. No way was she getting dessert after dinner tonight. Equals equals equals. Alpha watched the children march in formation each wearing a metal helmet several sizes too large for them. At the front, an older girl led them along, a slightly more ornate helm bobbing on her shoulders. When the children proposed their game, Alpha wasn't sure what to expect. Of course, the guards never asked who they would compete against, so they had no one to blame but themselves. He had to admit that the sly munchkins had pulled the rug out from under the guards. It was amusing to watch. 
Alpha was often accused of corrupting the children and being a bad influence or teaching bad habits. But for once, he could honestly say no one here needed much corrupting at all. It helped the game was the perfect opportunity to both test his newest toy and observe more of the strange abilities the people of this world seemed to have. He still wasn't fully convinced this wasn't some kind of shared esper ability, but humans weren't a species with such a thing, and that wouldn't explain the various animals he'd observed doing similar things. More data was necessary to fully understand it. As for his new toy, he wasn't sure if it could be called useful or just that. Nothing more than a novelty. His experiments with the heart crystals had hit a dead end, and he couldn't figure out why. He'd tried several combinations of lines and connection methods, but none had proven very stable or even usable so far. Instead, he'd turned his attention to the more stable but drained shard formed by the fracturing process. What little testing he could do with the limited equipment had shown they were just some kind of organic quartz, as he suspected, mostly. Rather than just silicon dioxide arranged in a crystalline pattern, the crystals appeared to use the quartz crystal to provide structure to several unknown inclusions he couldn't identify. Alpha theorized that it was these inclusions that actually stored the energy inside the crystal, with the quartz acting as a kind of insulation, but he had no proper way of testing this yet. What he had discovered, though, was that these crystal shards could be recharged, in a manner of speaking. By linking the shards to his test array, he'd siphoned off the energy into the shards, temporarily recharging them. This had the added benefit of keeping the test array stable for longer. His arrays likely exploded because of the constant flow of energy being pumped into them with nowhere to go, like a balloon filling with far more water than it could hold. Charging the shards drained some of the energy, releasing some of the pressure. They'd still fail, eventually, but Alpha could study the energy flow for far longer now. However, these recharged shards were far more explosive than even the cut gems and would quickly destabilize. Instead of letting the shards self-destruct and waste their energy, Alpha decided to do something more. Fun with them. Some quick simulations later and Alpha's prototype, Crystal Rail, system was finished. The idea was simple. Attach a small piece of shaped crystal shard to a modified rail round and then use one of the test arrays to recharge the crystal. That had been the trickiest part. But after some tweaking, he'd settled on a design that would slot the cut gem into the array on demand. Then decouple it before the system could overload. The result was interesting, if nothing less. He could extract dozens of raindrop-sized crystal shards from a single heart crystal. And once charged, each would explode into a small fireball a few inches across. That was almost as effective as some of the Federation's low-grade explosives. Alpha was excited about the concept. If he could refine it further, it might be a respectable alternative to the more resource-expensive rail rounds and free up that material for other projects. The prototype system had some major downsides. However, less metal meant less mass. This translated into far lower kinetic power and velocity. That meant the crystal rounds would have a harder time piercing harder armor, making them rely more on their explosive damage than sheer impact or penetration. If he was just going up against biologicals, especially things like the penguins, that might not matter much. But even some tougher mundane megafauna could shrug off lower caliber rail rounds. Now give those creatures magic powers on top of that, their, crystal rail, would likely not have much effect at all. At least in its present state, there was also his current limited supply of actual heart crystals. Sure, he had a few hundred at this point, but it wasn't like he could turn all of them into ammunition. He still needed a lot of them to experiment and study. It's possible the entire system was a complete waste of resources as well and he just didn't know it yet. Nonetheless, it was a good start. Equals equals equals. Three days. Kallik had been stuck in various meetings and talks for three entire days. One could argue that for a cultivator of her level, that wasn't too long. After all, some cultivators could spend weeks or even months in meditation and seclusion. But those times were filled with peaceful meditation and reflection, not constant bickering and political maneuvering by this elder or that. 
There was a reason she'd chosen to take a more hands-on approach with the young apprentices when she rose to elder herself. She'd rather deal with that insanity than be stuck in a room with these geezers daily, but sometimes, you had to do what you had to do, that was simply the way of things. Not that this particular discussion should have taken more than a few hours, but someone always had more to say. The hottest topic of debate was, of course, the Lord Protector. Even with all of their eyewitness accounts, no one could decide if he was truly a progenitor or not. Some elders flat out denied it, thinking such a thing was preposterous, that the creature was a danger and should be killed or chased away. Others assumed the spirit beast was simply an extraordinarily powerful being, and even if it wasn't a progenitor, it could still be swayed to their side as an ally. After all, many large villages had powerful guardian beasts of their own. Why shouldn't the slate walkers? More still were fully invested in Calic's progenitor theory, but even then, there was division. Few could agree whether they should report events in their entirety to the jade walkers or hide the maybe progenitor for themselves. Both sides had their fair points. If they reported everything to the Jade Walkers, the status of the Slate Walker village would instantly skyrocket, regardless of the truth. That meant more support, more supplies, and better access to services they couldn't provide themselves. But that also risked the Lord Protector being stolen by the much more powerful and wealthy Jade Walkers. While the Slate Walkers were technically subordinate to the city itself, None in the village had a particular fondness for the overly pompous High Clan, especially after some of the trouble they had been causing the past few years. Not reporting everything would let them keep their secrets and possibly buy them time to both win over the Lord Protector's favor and gather the strength to push back against anyone who might try to poke their nose in further. But it would also leave some glaring holes in their story. Holes that might attract the wrong kind of attention. And so the arguments went back and forth, over and over and over. It took three days for them to finally come to a decision, and frankly, Kalik wasn't too excited about it. But then, what could she do? 13, Book 1, Lesson 37, Plans Should Be Flexible. The small gathering comprised most of the people Alpha would have expected, Alagan, Kalik, the captain, whom he'd yet to hear anyone actually refer to by name the senior guard Rejuaton, and two older gentlemen who only introduced themselves as Elder Ganzerig and Elder Batu. Then, of course, Al for himself, the two he hadn't expected to see were Ganbata and Zolzaya. It was Alpha's understanding that the two were just stepping into adulthood by the village's standards, so it struck the AI as odd that they would be invited to such an important meeting. A sentiment that was echoed by Elder Ganzerig. Kalik. Why are the children here? Kalik turned to answer, but Zolzaya beat her to it. The young woman cupped her hands and bowed at the hip as she spoke. With all due respect, Elder Ganzerig, we have passed our apprenticeships. We are no longer children. We are also some of the few with first-hand accounts of the events we will discuss. Thus, I believe it's imperative we understand our next steps from here. Elder Ganzerig furrowed his brow and raised a hand but his words were stopped but a gentle hand on his shoulder, the owner of the hand in question, Elder Batu, was the one to speak instead. The young woman is not wrong, my friend, if things are to go as planned, keeping them in the loop will only help. The other elder frowned but said nothing more, Alpha didn't miss the smile on the face of the guard named Duaton, even hidden by the man's scruffy beard, Alpha chuckled to himself. He liked the young woman, even if she didn't seem too fond of him. She reminded him of a young woman named Madeline back in the Federation, a native to one of his more recent conquests. She was young, even by Federation standards, but she was also stubborn, resourceful, and far more intelligent than those around her gave her credit for. In only a few short years, the young woman had risen from an orphaned street rat to Alpha's chief mechanic and overseer of most of his production labs. Not that you'd know Alpha was in charge if you ever heard Madeline speak to him. The young woman was rougher than some grizzled soldiers three times her age and was one of the few people able to keep some of Alpha's more eccentric ideas in check. As Alpha reminisced, Solzaya turned to him and narrowed her eyes, as if sensing his amusement. Alpha stared back, the black face of his primary optical sensor plate spinning, 
She broke eye contact only as the rest of the group continued. The captain was first to speak. There's been a slight change of plans. New information has come to light, and we need to up the schedule. Ganbert raised his hand and asked. In what way? We weren't informed of the original plan. The captain nodded. The village elders had chosen to send your group. You, Zolzar, Alagan, and Kalik, along with a guardian escort, ahead to the Earth Shrine. Officially, you'll be there to get you to emergency care. The others are recovering well, but the young man needs better care than we can give. The group's eyes fell at the mention of the young man. Alva had been monitoring his condition through the nanites still in his system, and it wasn't good. They kept him stable so far, in no small part thanks to the medical nanites, but he still needed extensive surgery. If Alva had a base set up, he could have thrown Uta into the recovery pod for a few days, and he'd be fine. But the village was missing several key components that the AI needed to print such a complicated device. That was even before considering the overall expense, in nanites and resources, to set it up. Not that he'd be the one paying for it, of course, but the fact remained it wasn't feasible at the moment. Elder Ganzerig was the next to speak. While there, Alagan and Kalik will attempt to contact the Eclat representative stationed at the shrine. If Alagan's theory is correct, and the beast lorded allies within the wandering cities, we believe it's safer to contact the Eclat directly rather than tip off any who might be listening. The captain nodded, then turned to look at the Alpha and continued. At first, we'd planned to ask the Lord Protector to transport the group most of the way before returning. The elders have decided it is in everyone's best interests that the Jade Walkers aren't made aware of his presence just yet. At least not until the child is found. Elder Batter turned and bowed to Alpha as he elaborated. We mean no insult, Lord Protector. We don't believe you would needlessly cause trouble. Ha 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 ha. Alpha mentally broke out into laughter, earning another glare from Zolzire. The Elder continued, unaware, but the Jade Walkers, as a whole, have a reputation for being reactive. We feel it would simplify things if they're unaware of your involvement. Such a thing could give any traitorous elements in the city the opening they need to slip away, or worse bend events in their favor, Alpha mentally frowned but agreed, he could just waltz into town and stir up the place, but a hostile takeover at this point in time would be counterproductive, the captain again took over, as I mentioned, however, new information means we must change our plans, Lord Protector, if you would, the torp bobbed in acknowledgement and switched on his holographic projection, the two elders jumped, Alpha never tired of that, but the others had already seen this ability and only stared. Alpha's map of the region had grown substantially since the ruins. Not only had the village itself been making steady progress along their route, but Alpha had sent out swarms of wasp drones to scout the areas they passed through. It was still only a sliver of the size of entire prairies, estimated by high altitude scanning, but it was impressive. The group took a moment to marvel at the sight, but it was. Surprisingly, Ganbata who noticed what they were supposed to see. The young man narrowed his eyes and pointed to an image on the map. A cartoonish looking face of a black and white creature. Its tongue happily hanging from its mouth. Is that what I think it is? The image was far to the north, so far away. In fact, that no, wasp, had even come close to reaching it yet. Though the map was updated in real time as several drones made a beeline toward the location. Alpha spoke only a single word, still maintaining the mysterious and dignified persona he was cultivating. To the side, Solzaya put her face in her hand and sighed. Yes, Ganbetta's face lit up as he spoke excitedly. Then what are we waiting for? We know where she is now, let's go rescue her. The smaller clit pup had saved his life several times now, in fact, so he would jump on any chance to repay even a small part of that debt. It helped that he genuinely enjoyed the child's company, many other Eclid were said to be more aloft and cold, preferring the company of the strong and fierce. The child was far more friendly and excitable, reminding him of his younger sister when she was that age. Dewitton held out a hand, his words smothering the young man's excitement. It's not that simple, Ganna. Uta still needs treatment, and the Eclid still need to be warned about the Beast Lord's plots. 
Gan Batafar owed his brow and clenched his fists. So we're just going to leave her? We don't know what these people's intentions are. By the time we tell her family, it might already be too late. Duetan nodded. You're right. We don't know who these people are or what they want with the child. But that's all the more reason we can't go rushing off. What if it's a powerful clan or some high-level cultivator none of us have a chance against? Remember, these people stole the child away from under the nose of the Lord Protector. Distracted as he was or not, can you say that even if you rushed to them immediately, you could do anything meaningful to help her? Gan Bata frowned and tried to respond, but found no words. After a moment, he looked at the ground, the Capitan picked up after Jewetan. We're not abandoning her. Young man, don't fear. We just have to play the part we can and leave the rest to those with the power necessary to do more. Gan Bat nodded but said nothing more. Instead, it was Zolzaya who spoke. Then how has the plan changed? The Capitan to the young woman. Mostly the same. The Lord Protector will still transport the group most of the way to the Earth Shrine, but instead of returning, he has agreed to track the signal further and either gather information or attempt a rescue. Meanwhile, you four will approach the shrine with the information we have. With any luck, the Euclid representative will respond swiftly. That is what they are supposedly there for, after all, there's only one slight hiccup we're unsure what to make of. Alagan spoke up for the first time, also unaware of the changes until now. What's the problem? Kalik answered him. The location the child has appeared. We've compared the Lord Protector's map to our own and are reasonably sure we know where the child has been taken. The Temple of the Prima, the group, even the elders, fell into silence, looks of confusion passing over them in a wave. Apparently, this was recent news to most of them. Elder Ganzarig was the first to recover. That is most peculiar. Why would they bring the child there? After all, the temple is the seat of power for the Eclat. Could they have already recovered her? Kalik shook her head. It's possible, but I highly doubt it. Something is wrong. What do you mean? Gan Batra asked. Solzaya was the one to respond. Because it's Abditis Apex. Kalik nodded and continued. Correct. The darkest night is only a few days away. The Radiant Heart, where the Temple of the Prima is located, will be at its most chaotic and dangerous. At that time, even the Eclat would have migrated to their Earth Shrines weeks ago. A year on Relictus was broken down into four seasons, each, in turn, broken into a month of Genesis, Apex, and Requiem. For a total of twelve months, Abditus, the season of darkness, was when the sun was almost completely hidden behind the celestial sister. The larger planet that Relictus orbited. Even what little daylight the planet got was brief, with only the warmth radiating from the sister keeping the planet from freezing. The month of Apex was the harshest. As the planet entered the larger planet's shadow, the radiant seas got little snow. In fact, Gan Bata could count the number of times he'd seen snow on both hands. But that didn't stop the harsh winds and biting cold from infecting the prairies. The darkest night was by far the most dangerous time of the month. On this day, in the middle of Apex, in the middle of Abditis, Relictus would be fully enveloped by the sisters' shadow, completely cutting off the light and warmth of the sun to their planet. This was a difficult time in most places, as the yin, shadow, and ice-aligned spirit energies skyrocketed, causing all sorts of trouble. In the radiant seas, where the spirit energy was already chaotic, this event was cataclysmic. Only the Earth's shrines and temples were safe, as they absorbed this insane influx of energy from the area. The only other time that could be compared was the brightest day, during Lux Apex, when the planet baked under the combined heat of the local star and the celestial sister. The alternating seasons in between, Restituo and Acasus, respectively, were used to gather supplies and prepare. It wasn't a stretch to say that most people's lives on Relictus revolved around preparing for these two yearly events. Either cultivators and mages working to gather the rare and powerful natural treasures that appeared during the events, or the common man, simply trying to survive them. Gan Bata tilted his head, still confused, but I don't understand. Aren't the Earth Temples even safer than the Earth Shrines? 
Why would it be dangerous? Solzaya answered him with a sigh. This is why you should pay attention during lessons, Gana. What is the purpose of the Earth Shrines? Gan better turned to her and frowned. To provide shelter during Apex? Solzaya shook her head. Wrong. That's just a welcomed side effect. The shrines and temples were built long before the wandering cities ever settled the prairies, remember? Who would they protect? Gan Bata's frown deepened, but the barriers Solza cut him off. Are later additions by the Eclit to extend their effects? Gan Bata threw his hands into the air. Fine, then you tell me, big brain, what are they used for? Solza grinned ear to ear. To gather energy, Gan Bata sighed as Solza continued, or, to be more exact, to absorb the chaotic energy of the prairies and channel it. Gan Bata's eyes went wide as it clicked. To the heart. Kalik nodded and took over. Correct. All the energy gathered by the various earth shrines and temples throughout the Radiant Sea is directed and concentrated in the Radiant Heart at the center of the Temple of the Prima. This also means that during Lux and Abditus Apex, when those energies are at their strongest and the most volatile, the heart becomes one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Even the Eclit, when their natural resistances are forced to abandon the area. Alagan frowned and asked. Then, why would whoever took the child bring them to such a dangerous place? And now, of all times, Kalik turned and mirrored the man's frown. Yes. That's the question. Isn't it? 11, Book 1, Lesson 38. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Next, the village was a buzz of activity as preparations for the group's departure were underway. Only the higher-ups in the village understood the real reason, with most of the village being told they were sending out an advanced group to get you to the help he needed. Not inaccurate, but not the full truth, either. The captain stood guard over the group of various villagers and families, stoically watching. Jewerton, his right hand had volunteered to lead the trip to the Earth Shrine. The captain suspected mostly to keep an eye on his daughter. The quiet man had been a wreck while the village waited to learn the fate of the last apprentice group, and he'd yet to leave his daughter's side for more than a short while since. Jewerton's chosen second had been a surprise, though. Monk was a shy woman, almost to the point of timidness, coupled with her dainty size and disdain for combat. She was the exact opposite of what most would call a guardian. That didn't stop her from being the foremost defensive expert in the village or even the Jade Walker city. Despite being an entire greater step and several lesser, stronger than her, the captain doubted even he could break through her defenses quickly. It wasn't a stretch to say she had been considered the most talented young guardian of her generation overall, even if she was slightly slower on the cultivation side of things had been. That was. That title had been snatched up by the third and final member of the group's escort and the village's newest senior guardian, Alagan. From upper, bronze spirit, to mid silver spirit, the captain couldn't help but shake his head at that kind of insane growth. What had the young man seen to suddenly shoot up the ranks so much? Something in his gut told him he didn't want to know. They needed to be quick, with the darkest night less than a week away. Thankfully, they could pack light for this trip, as the Lord Protector would bring the group within a few hours walk from the Earth Shrine. Close enough that they shouldn't encounter any serious issues, but far enough away that they shouldn't be detected, either. The village itself would still take a few more days to arrive, but if everything went according to plan, things should be wrapped up by then. As for the Lord Protector himself, the captain sighed and turned to the largest gathering present, one composed entirely of children, all surrounding a large, metal spirit beast. The gang had grown to over a hundred now, and the captain doubted there was a child under thirteen, too young to start their apprenticeships yet, in the village missing. They had been oddly quiet for some time now, and for Slate Walker children, quiet was often very suspicious. The captain could even see several on the fringes whispering to each other, staring at something. He narrowed his eyes and approached, hiding his presence, saying goodbye to the Lord Protector. Are you? As one, the group jumped and turned, staring up at him with wide eyes. The group was silent momentarily before a younger boy in the crowd stuttered out. Why yes, sir. Just. Just saying gee goodbye, nothing else. Nope. Not at all. What was that for? 
The group went silent once more. The captain frowned and raised a brow, folding his arms. An older girl near the back, wearing a familiar ornate helmet, pointed at him and yelled. He's on to us. Scatter, like a colony of fleeing insects. The children broke in all directions, screaming the entire time. Once the area was cleared, the captain turned to Lord Protector and stared. The Lord Protector stared back in silence before raising his arms in the air and speaking. I know nothing. The captain could only turn around and sigh, shaking his head. But why do you have to be the ones to go? We just got our daughter back, and now you want to drag her off into more danger? The others who can do it instead, please, just stay home. Solzar stared at the sobbing woman clinging to her father, warring emotions tumbling through her head. Her mother's words were about what she expected, if she was honest. She wouldn't call the woman simple-minded, but she had never hidden her desires or pretended to be anything more than what she was. That could be good. And bad. Yet, instead of the hard-faced matriarch who ruled her home with an iron grip she'd grown up with, the woman in front of her seemed like a stranger. In the short time she'd been gone, Solzaya's mother had gone from slightly pudgy, full of vigor and fire, to a thinning, hollow-faced woman with deep shadows on her face. She might have only been a simple weaver, but her own natural talent and help from her father had seen the woman well into mid-bronze spirit to be in this kind of state after only a few weeks. Had she even eaten once since Zolzaya had left? The sight, coupled with what her gift was telling her, made Zolzaya question if she ever really understood why her mother was the way she was. When she'd first come home, she'd expected the same anger, frustration, and that infuriating, righteous self-certainty that she was right, that had triggered their fight before the apprentice's test had started. Instead, her mother had wrapped her in a hug and sobbed, nearly overwhelming Zolzai with an odd mixture of deep sorrow and euphoric joy. What anger that was present wasn't directed at her daughter, but at herself. The whole encounter had been strange. When was the last time she'd seen her mother openly weep? It had to have been years ago, when her father was almost killed because Zolzai refused to play along with that pompous young master who thought he could have anything he wanted with the snap of his fingers, even her, her mother's smile had died that day, replaced with a near constant seething anger lurking just under the surface, her grip over Zolzai's life had tightened, and the young woman always suspected her mother blamed her for her father's injury, at least in part. But now, now Zolzaya didn't know what to think if she was honest. Was learning there was more to your parents just a part of growing up? Or was she seeing more than she had before? She didn't know and didn't really have the time to think about it. Her mother turned to her and hugged her. The slightly shorter woman burying her face in Zolzaya's chest as she sobbed. Please, don't go. I don't want to lose you again. Zolzaya hesitated for a moment, but slowly returned the hug fighting back her own tears. I, have to, mother, I can't leave Yuta to Gana alone. Her mother flinched in her arms at the mention of Yuta. She'd been opposed to the two taking the oath at first. She'd have likely outright rejected the idea entirely if Yuta's mother wasn't her own o other sister, but he'd grown on her over the years, and Solzai had gotten more than one scolding for getting the poor boy into trouble. Her mother's hug grew tighter, and Solzai gently pushed her away. She looked into the older woman's eyes, mimicking her mother's tone when she wanted Solzai to pay close attention. Mother, I must. I'm not a child anymore, and there are things I have to do. Things only I can do. Her mother stared back, wide-eyed, before falling silent and lowering her eyes. As she spoke, her voice was softer than Solzai could ever remember it being. I. I just want you to be safe, Zaya. You. Solzai cut her off, speaking softly. I know, mother. They were silent for a moment longer before her mother turned to her father. She stared at the ground for a moment before looking up at him, a small fire in her eyes, appearing a little more like the woman she was before. She poked her husband in the chest and spoke, You bring our girl back, you hear me? I don't want any excuses. You, she choked, almost breaking into a sob again. When she recovered, her words were softer. You, protect her. All right, Jewetan stared down at his wife, a soft smile spreading on his face. He reached out and wrapped both women in a deep hug, gently whispering, With my life, 
Gan Berta stood a few feet from the makeshift travel bed on which his friend lay. He'd already said goodbye to his family and even had to pull his little sister out of her hiding spot on the Lord Protector. He was sure the powerful spirit beast was just kidding when it pretended not to notice the young girl crawl into the carrier box, but this wasn't the time to put up with her antics. Besides, his mother would kill him if she actually sneaked along with them. After saying his goodbyes, he'd gone to check on Yuta to find the young man's mother kneeling beside his still form, openly weeping. That had been uncomfortable. Gan Berta didn't remember ever seeing Yuta's mother crying before. In fact, she was by far one of the most cheery and happy people he'd ever met, in stark contrast to Zaya's own rigid and often heavy-handed mother. As a herbalist, Gan Berta's mother socialized with a different group than those two, so they weren't too close. But when they did interact, often after one of their three children's hijinks went awry, she liked to joke how the two seemed to be two sides of the same coin. Gan Berta had to agree with his mother's assessment. Yutu's father, the man who'd taught Gan better much of what he knew, stood behind her in full guardian attire. The man stood stoic, but Gan better could still see the tear streaks on his face through the opening on his helm. The man had volunteered for the escort team, as had Gan better's own father, but both had been turned down by the elders. Other than needing to travel light, too large of a group would draw unwanted attention before they could speak to the shrine. Gan Berta's father wasn't weak by any means, but Yutu and Solazaya's fathers were both vice captains. It was already suspicious enough that Jewetan was leading the group, two vice captains and three elites stepping away from the village, all for the sake of one boy, would raise questions they weren't ready to answer. Likely sensing his approach, Yutu's father turned round and met Gan Berta's eyes. The older man placed a hand on his wife's shoulder then turned and walked towards the younger man, Gan Berta's back straightened, and he saluted the vice-captain, who returned the gesture. The two stood in awkward silence for a moment before Gan Berta tried to speak. Sir, I, I'm sorry, I should ha. Yutu's further raised a hand and cut him off. Should haves are for politicians and philosophers, young man. You may not be a guardian in name. But you've always had one's heart. Don't taint that with beating yourself up over what you should have done. Instead, strive to do better next time. Gan better paused. He wanted to look away, but met the older man's eyes and clenched his fists as he responded. Yes, sir. The vice captain smiled and nodded, then clasped the young man on his shoulder. Your father's been bragging about you you know, won't shut up about how his boy stared down the beast lord and stood strong against an entire army, Gan better blushed and turned away at that, scratching his head, he stuttered slightly at the praise, I didn't, I mean, it's not as I impressive as it seems, they were just grass breakers after all, besides, his gaze fell to his leg, the makeshift prosthetic replaced with a finely crafted wooden leg just below his knee, he was still getting used to it, but it was a work of art courtesy of his uncle, one of the better carpenters in the village. The carving was so detailed that he doubted anyone could tell it was a prosthetic if he wore shoes and long pants. It was even carved from a block of cloud ash, making it exceptionally light. The rare wood would have cost more than a fresh trapper like himself could have afforded in years, but the elders had taken the cost on the village as a reward for his actions. His teacher's eyes also fell on the leg and he frowned, his grip on the young man's shoulder tightening slightly, he turned hard eyes to the young man and spoke solemnly, never be ashamed of what you gave up to save another, even if you make mistakes, use them as tools to learn and grow, not bury yourself under their weight, then, just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone, replaced with a bright smile, the man patted his shoulder and laughed, besides, you'll get used to it, in time. You might not be the most talented in this generation of monsters, but you'll make up for it in heart. I'm sure of that. Gan Berta furrowed his brow, skeptical that he would ever get used to it or even be allowed to go out on another gathering trip with such a crippling injury. However, before he could speak, Yutu's further leaned in. The man looked around as if checking to ensure no one was looking their way. He then pulled off the thick metal gauntlet from his hand to relieve a silky-looking black glove. Gan Berta tilted his head in confusion, 
but his eyes suddenly widened as the older man removed the glove. Instead of seeing healthy flesh, Gan Berta caught the gleam of blue metal. Almost 3 5 ths of the man's left hand was simply missing, with only the pointer and thumb remaining flesh. His other three digits, and a sizable portion of his palm, had been replaced with a dull blue metal Gan Berta couldn't identify. The metal appeared fused to what remained of the man's hand, but instead of being lifeless and rigid, the metal flexed and bent like it had always been there. The man even twisted and turned the metal hand in various directions as if showing off, grinning the entire time. Gan Berta frowned, then asked, what happened to never being ashamed? The man laughed, and with a flex of spirit energy, the metal became spiked and jagged in some spots while others slithered around like metal tentacles. One finger even morphed into a vicious looking dagger. With a chuckle, he spoke, don't be ashamed, but don't share information that might come in handy later. Yutus further laughed at possibly the worst pun the young man had ever heard him say, yet Gan Berta could only stare, mouth open and eyes wide. The man replaced his glove and gauntlet, then patted the younger man's shoulder again. His grin never dropped as he spoke. Like I said, you'll adapt. You're smarter than you give yourself credit for. Ganna, never give up, and keep walking your path. I have full confidence you'll proudly stand side by side with you to and Zaya one day. The man then stood straight and saluted before turning and walking back to his wife and son. Gan better return the salute his back a little straighter and the embers in his heart a little brighter. Unnoticed by either, the grass at Ganbata's feet stood a little straighter and grew a little taller than those around them. Soon, Solzile approached the group, her parents following behind. As her parents broke off to greet Tutu's parents, her mother wrapping her weeping Oath sister in a deep hug, Solzile walked toward Ganbata. Neither spoke, but both could see the resolution burning in the other's eyes. They nodded, and as one, they turned and walked toward the group gathering around the Lord Protector. It was time to get going. From a distance, Elder Batter watched the departing pair with interest, stroking his long beard. Unnoticed by others, his eyes flashed with mysterious energy, and he stared at the spot where Gan Batter had stood only a moment earlier. A small smile crept on his face, and he muttered to himself, Interesting. Very interesting indeed.